the size of the agenda. I think we should just get that started. Um, and first up is public comment. I believe we have Rick here from SBA. Hi, uh, thanks for the time and opportunity. So I'm here, I know I'll be short. So right now uh, we don't have any more uh, centers, disaster recovery center from FEMA and SBA. The last one was in very city uh, today. They closed, so we're still here. Why I'm here? Because uh, uh, we want uh, the government to help us to reach the most people as possible, sharing the information through social media website, um, email, or in the bulletin boards. Why? Because the people can still apply uh, with FEMA and SBA for the grace period, for the two weeks grace period. Of course, they have to justify why they're applying late. The deadlines, they were October 31st, but the people can still apply. Uh, that deadline with the SBA that was for physical damages, that means for infrastructure, real estate inventory equipment, for businesses, homeowners, renters, and nonprofits. Oh, this is related to the past floods of July 7, between July 7 and July 21. So that's why we are still here. Right now, we, we are going to be on the field. Uh, we are going to work on the long-term recovery. We don't have any more physical centers, like we said, but uh, we have a deadline for economic damages. That's for the next year with the SBA in April 15. So that's for the losses and profits for the businesses and so on, non-profits. That's the most important information right now. Uh, I brought some flyers, uh, of, so, uh, flyers from the USDA. Um, and so in for information, the 100 number, that's the first step to the people because right now they don't have any place to go. The 800 number is there and also the website because the people can apply through the website. I know that it's not that easy, but we don't have any more centers in Vermont. The last one was in Berry City uh, today and they closed. So Rick, what is the new deadline? Uh, the, new, the new deadline uh, is uh, for economic damages, the losses on profits uh, for businesses. Um, some non-profits, that's for April 15 of the next year. Uh, like I said, the deadline for physical damages, that, are, that already expired, but because FEMA and SBA, we have a two weeks grace period, the people can still apply with both. Of course, they have to justify why, why they are applying late. So that's very important so to me. that would be November 14th? Exactly, two weeks after uh, um, October 31st. Okay. Great. Any yeah, that's the most important information. That? I don't want to talk anymore, I know that. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that the agenda is very tight. I saw the agenda. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. Well, thank you for, for being here. Thank you for that information. Thanks for letting us know. Thank you. Bye. All right, so if the minutes can reflect, we have a quorum now. So we'll go on to, yeah, go on to uh, approval of the agenda. Move the agenda. Accept All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Shakiri's consent calendar. That we can approve the consent calendar. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries new business. We have two rivers out of Quichi here on a grant proposal. Uh, hey, Joe Nunes, he's on under another name. Kevin Geiger was going to jump on around this time. He's the, uh, the two rivers he's on. contact for that. So. So yeah, Sydney's here, but I think she's here for the bylaw stuff. So oh, okay. if you want to maybe even table this, see if Kevin has a chance to jump on. I think for IB, I see Amy's here, so you could certainly do that. Okay, so um, grant application request for Kimball. This is a request for 16000 for the Fiber Connect grant. Anybody have any questions on that one? And then he will do a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Boards and committees. We have one applicant for the rec committee. I can't see if she's in the room. I 
don't see the name. Yeah. Tanya's here. here. Is she here? Okay. Yep. Anybody have any questions? Seeing none, any motions? I will make the motion to make the appointment. Second. Others in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, annual tree lighting permit. Tree tree. Before we move on, would it be appropriate at this moment just to talk a little bit about the the various committees and how well they're being populated right now and who the select board members are who are connected with them? Do you got the cheat sheet on it? No. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I'm not no. in front. Maybe that's too much. On, uh, on yeah, we'll do that. Just, um, we can ask for a status. Yeah, at, at some point I think we I think we should. I think, um, I think there's certain committees that can use some beefing up, and, mm -hmm. and we also never, um, um, when Alyssa came on, we, we never um, sort of... All of them. <laughs> we, never, we never kind of, you know, can, can reconfigure that situation. So it's worth a, worth a look, some, worth a look sometime December soon. Agenda. Sure. Permit for the tree lighting. Any questions on that one? Did Morgan's on if you have any questions. In? Morgan's on if you have any questions. Trevor, has Scott approved that? I believe they sat down and went through everything. No road closures, smaller footprint than Halloween. Um, Anybody have any questions on the application they got? Uh, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, VTRAN's sidewalk scoping study grant application. We got the feedback that we could do both. Mm -hmm. 60000 which is what we were yep. hoping for was a low run out. Yep, um, that was good news. I didn't see anything that came through in the proposal. Do we have a draft of the grant application? Other yep, than it's any in. changes to that? Any questions anybody has on that? Um, would we be able from the scoping study to look at the small scale? Um, like just do a comparison cost wise to this like think about phasing it out in a small scale state. That, <clears throat> yeah, that's usually part of one of these scoping okay. studies, sort of like it'll identify like the next steps okay. and what some possible funding options would be. So it for, doesn't lock us into the federal. <clears throat> nope. Nope. The town could take the results of the scoping study and just it the build shelf. it themselves if I mean it's not going to be a set of design plans. You know? Right. Question. I, I saw on the map that, that proposes that the sidewalk go down Weston Street just past Hale Street, and I'm wondering why you chose that spot to, to, um, to stop it. Yeah, past Hale Street? Yeah. That might just be a slight... I didn't pick that up. Um, the RPC helped me with the map, so they may have... That might have just been a... That wasn't the intent. Yes. I, I was thinking that we were that it would go down to the senior center. I was thinking that it would go down to the inter the railroad intersection. Right? Oh. So, that, so then we have a possibility of being able to walk a whole loop from downtown Weston Street, School Street. So if, if we could have the scoping study include that <coughs> stretch, all the way to all the way to, to where it connects with School Street. I don't see why that. I mean. Yeah. Um, you can't have okay. a sidewalk terminate at a railroad crossing, though. So you gotta either go over it or stop at a natural before that. Yeah. So you may have to look at, and maybe you just want to look at the whole thing, that whole as a whole loop. Then you yeah, the I'm sure that'll be the that'll be the kind of thing that would get you know kind of more fully fleshed out. Yeah, I can definitely make that change. Any other questions? Seeing any online motions to approve? 
That's so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. You in person and online. I wanted to see who is online, but I can now see after I'm online that it's on the screen. So, so you're on, on, on the screen sitting in the room. Yeah, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> two of you. <laughs> Guess who the real one Jeff. is. Yeah. 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 We always need more Jeff. Um, yeah. We're going to skip over a few items to get to ones where we have folks in the room. Um, for the village fire department side by side. Um, so, we, can you just give us a status of what the league, the league said they would insure it? What was there? Were there any conditions on that? Other than we've got a, we should connect with loss control, and so we started that process. We don't have a sort of a full set of, you know, if you added here are the things to consider, best practices, users, training, so we'll keep working that. But yeah. They can insure it, they consider it a category of what they call all other municipal equipment or all other equipment. And it's about four hundred dollars per year to add it. And so we'll give it one of our loss control consultant on and some of those safety preparedness stuff to pass on to the, the, the fire department folks. Should should you accept that on jump in front of you there? But if we accept it, it should be with the understanding that they have to meet the loss control stuff. Mm -hmm. That's pretty standard with all the buildings. We have them go through. Larry comes once or twice a year, goes through those for the building inspections, looks at some of those pieces. Different Larry. Different Larry. Different Larry. <laughs> 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 so I don't remember any of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any questions on that from anybody? Any motions? I'll make a motion that we uh, we add the side by side vehicle contingent upon the loss control issue uh, being addressed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Um, all right. Enter municipal energy coordinator proposal. Well, wow, we're really moving right along. We're going to do this. You can if you want. You don't have to. Turn you about the bylaw. We don't need Kevin for the bylaw discussion. Uh, so Sydney can handle it. Sydney can handle it. Sydney can handle it. Sydney can handle it. We'll go back to it. Okay. Yep. Uh, we had one more. Let's get out of here. Has some another meeting to get. Oh yeah, no, that's a problem. I just didn't know. We're waiting here. Or not. So, um, did I get? Yeah, hold on a sec. So I'm I'm Jerry Ward, um, and John Pimentel and I have been kind of informally self-appointed to the regional multi-town committee that I think you've already heard about from Nicole Sear. And maybe someone else in the past. Yeah, it couple of Alyssa would not have heard about it because she wasn't here. But, um, and I'm not exactly sure at what point it was the development was when when you last heard. So I'd like to just give a little brief recap of the rationale for the position <coughs> and describe um, the examples that exist in area towns a little bit and really get quickly into what I think you really want to hear about is the potential job description and what in my opinion is finally a, an actionable, reasonable proposal that is, I think, could pretty cost effectively provide leadership, depending a lot on the person who gets into this position. But um, it could be a way to galvanize the effort for multiple towns, all of which are smaller than Randolph and Randolph, to be able to take on the goals of meeting energy, energy resilience and the benchmarks that, are, that we keep hearing that we're supposed to be meeting and if we're honest with ourselves, we're not meeting them. So that's kind of, if you can go on to the next one, that's kind of quickly what, what 
John and I are going to talk about today. And Jeff may want to chime in some too. Because <laughs> Yeah. Which one? <laughs> Just on the chat. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go pretty quickly for the first part. And if, if you want me to get a little chime in questions, just speak, because I'm going to assume that at least some of you have read the handout and some of you have seen the part of the presentation. So. So um, we can go on to the next one. So all this um, really, um, I, I guess that from Bethel's perspective, they helped prepare this slide. It was the Vermont Council on Rural Development that catalyzed the process and got, I'm not sure how many towns, it was up to 14 towns that all together for a series of facilitated discussions that really dug quite deep into climate change response at the municipal level and help towns realize what they could do and ended up with a list of potential community actions. Um, mostly in goals one and two up there, you can s summarize it. Um, they came down looking pretty heavily on the need for town energy committees to get more informed, more mobilized, and and detected a weakness in the spirit of volunteers on those committees um, that needed some attention. And um, we can go to the next slide. Um, th these are the towns that were originally there. Don't let your jaw drop. They're not all still there in an active form. It's down to less than half of that number of towns that are still coming and acting like they're interested. Um, but the, the clear focus on a single goal out of a bunch of possibilities was to establish a structure to hire a regional energy coordinator. That was the most actionable, useful goal that they thought would be cost effective. Thank you. Um, so um, the reason for this energy coordinator is um, to help meet all these benchmarks that um, have been for years populating our mail and our present, and that some people have come to us. But you know, the legislature had the Vermont the Climate Action Plan in 2021 and the Comprehensive Energy Plan in 2022. And Two Rivers keeps sending out these, uh, when I was on the select board, I remember getting them, and they were pretty dispiriting report cards about how, how we're flunking out and if, if, that's, if that's what we're being judged on. And so we're, we're not doing a very good job on energy. And it's not just Randolph. I'm not bashing Randolph. It's, we do better than most towns. But um, they identified <coughs> lack of human resources as perhaps the major thing that could be quickly addressed um, in, in, as a common thread throughout all these towns. So, um, you can go on to the next, uh, next one. This summarizes the reasons to have our energy resilience coordinator. Um, and I suspect this is about where Nicole got to you with you with, with the presentation. Um, the biggest thing from the fiscal standpoint is to save dollars by being able to share the cost of a position across multiple towns. And so there's no, none of these towns would be able to do it on their own, and this way it becomes more affordable by a by several fold factor. And this, they would increase the capacity to be able to apply for grants, um, IRA money, meet the Benchmarks. I think you can, that, that 
piece about mitigating risks of oil dependency is nice, but it's kind of fluff. It's, it's not where we're going to be <laughs> with this kind of proposal for a while, anyway. And a big one would be able to, um, we'd have a, a cadre of other towns who are in the same boat working together, and we can share some resources, some, some expertise, and some ideas. So I think there could be some um, so, some uh, collective wisdom there that would, would help to make the whole process more spirited. And um, one that's not on there that I would add is, um, to a large extent, I think this person could be a leader who could help facilitate some of the conflict that was identified between their municipalities and their energy committee volunteers and the people who are um, like two rivers that are urging us to get more compliant with the benchmarks. So, so it would be, be somebody there to help smooth out all those tensions and communications. <coughs> So um, in the next slide, um, this talks about some of the, we're not um, reinventing the wheel here. There's viable models that have already been happening for several years. Hartford took the lead, maybe it was five years ago, something like that. Um, and Sustainable Woodstock and Two Rivers had Stephen Bauer um, as a overall planner, I think was what his town, his, his um, job description was. Um, that's morphed now into the one that's partially occluded up there, which is the Two Rivers Inter-Municipal Regional Energy Coordinator, which is not a mythical beast. There's one of these right behind me right now. And in front. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and in front. <laughs> Um, Jeff Grout is um, s serving in that position right now. And, and this is what the proposed position that we're going to talk about is modeled after, because that seems to be working pretty well. Um, there's one major difference that's worth highlighting, though, is that it is modeled now as an employee of Two Rivers, I believe. And what they gave us as a proposal that made it a lot more affordable was to have it, what they called a remote position. Or I may have the word wrong, but it was somebody who wouldn't be physically housed there. I think they would actually maybe hire the person, but not um, be responsible for um, being uh, the boss of the person, really. The, the ultimate boss in this new model would be a committee of the towns. Each town would appoint somebody to, to would be the overseer. So it would be a more direct type of um, responsibility to, to, to this consortium of towns. And, and that model was achieved by um, a bunch of these towns in the discussion group so far have actually been select board members um, from Pittsfield, Royalton, and Braintree all had select board members. Well, I'm not sure about Brookfield. Uh, so, um, so I think they're thinking that if they're going to be employing somebody, they want somebody maybe more than the energy committee members who are most interested to, to be in the, involved in the overseeing this position. So, um, Jack, let me just ask you, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah. Does, um, that, does, that, does that sound like, about like a fair portrayal? Yeah, that, no, that's, it is. Um, I do work now for that in the um, regional energy coordinator position for two rivers. I work for six different towns in our region. 
um, we are actually making a lot of progress, and I, w I wasn't involved with this, so I've kind of been seeing this for the first time, although I did glance over it before, but thanks to John and Jerry for putting this together because it does model it pretty well. Um, some of my frustrations, I do think this would be a great fit for Randolph with the right structure. Um, one of my frustrations is I'm working on a lot of energy projects and we're getting, um, there's a lot of grants out there right now and I really think Randolph could benefit from those. So, um, and I know a lot of the town's problems, you know, these towns are very similar. Um, as far as not having the resources really to look into the grants that are available and to really know where your energy spend is in the town. Um, I don't know, I don't think anybody's tracking that in Randolph right now, but really that's one of the first things, first um, jobs of the energy coordinator is to make sure that you know where you're spending your money now and where you can improve it. Um, I've been doing this for a while, not just with this position, but generally, if you come into a town and you really, or a town or a commercial business, um, large building, whatever, when you really look at how the energy is, how the buildings and facilities are operated, somebody in this position could probably save 10, 20 percent without a whole lot of effort or a lot of expense. But I think I don't want to ramble on too much, but the um, the structure you mentioned is the same. The, the way it works now is I work with six different towns. Each town appoints a person, um, usually from their energy committee. Uh, we do have a few select board members, and they're the steering committee, and they direct um, where I spend my time and what's important with their um, community. I think this is great that you're talking to the select board because one of the largest challenges I have is I work with the energy committees, but I work for the select boards. They're the people that approve the funds and actually pay my salary. So um, you have to see the value and you have to align with your energy committees and sometimes that isn't the case. They're going off in different directions, but um, you know, it's a town leadership that really has a good feel for where the work really needs to be done. So I think this is good to, to put it in front of you and get um, buy-in up front because it works if you have um, leadership or direction from the top. You know, if it's something that you think is important for the town, it would be pretty easy to come in and get this job done. But if these things aren't important to you, if climate goals are not important, or if energy spend isn't important, um, and, or I shouldn't say important to you, but I mean, if that's not a priority for the town, if there's just not the funds or resources to do it, it's not gonna work. You really need to have, you know, it has to start at your level, I think, so. But we're doing some great things. There's a lot of um, energy funds for buildings. So up, um, the, the MERP, um, Municipal Energy Resilience Program, is specifically funded for old town buildings to improve weatherization and um, upgraded old heating systems. We have a few buildings in town that could definitely benefit from that. Um, there's EV charging grants, if that's a priority. I happen to think that's very important for Randolph is to get some charging stations downtown and drive these electric vehicles down into the town. Um, it's been shown that they really bring business to the area, <coughs> excuse me, when they, when they charge up. Um, they're spending at least a half hour in town, and we've got a lot of businesses that could probably use um, driving, you know, having that driving force to bring them to town, so. Um, I'll stop there and answer any questions, if there yeah. are any. And I think you'll have another chance in a few minutes, too. Yeah. Um, so if you can go on to the next slide, um, this is maybe um, the meat of what is, is most pertinent here tonight, um, the job description. Um, in a, and it's in your packet, so um, I'm not going to read it, but um, it's, it involves some things like tracking and recording the, the current town data, because unless you have a good handle on what that is, you can't do much to monitor how effective you are or even where to work or how it compares to industry standards. Um, and some of this could apply to schools too, I want to point out. Um, the schools notoriously have inefficient buildings. And it's a good place to um, be a role model too. Um, And a lot of this role with the 
end up being a facilitator and a mediator and a presenter at things like um, town meetings and school and school board meetings, maybe and select board meetings and energy committee meetings. So on the next one, I think we get to some actual potential projects. None of these are set in stone, but this is the kind of stuff that people want to see is what is, what is this person really going to do and how is it going to make a difference? And there's several projects outlined there um, and, and with the goal of getting to some deliverables. And I think we'd have to be straightforward. The first six months, probably everything you'd accomplish in 2024 is going to be just getting your feet wet and establishing relationships. When you have six or seven towns and you have to meet the energy committees, you have to get familiar with the town buildings, you have to meet the select board members, um, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look like nothing is happening for a while, is my sense. And so I think it's a bit aspirational to think that there's going to be great deliverables in 2024. If it doesn't start till July, the fiscal year, which is what I'm assuming, but I don't know that for sure. Um, so if, if that makes sense to you all, um, I will pass on one more We'll go to one more slide. We talked about the number, all the towns that were in on this discussion, and originally we were thinking about these four, these fourteen. And um, don't focus too much on the numbers. I just want to point out that Randolph is relatively huge. It's um, we're by far the biggest town. Here sometimes by a factor of 10. Um, and so it's one way or another, it's, it's inescapable that Randolph is going to be a big player in this, for better or worse, if, if we, assuming we sign up for it at all. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it just augments or uh, amplifies the, the notion that these are towns that would have very limited resources to do any kind of energy work with additional staff members um, because they are already so limited and it's hard to justify. But together, there's something we can do. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to John, who's going to walk through the actual model that we worked on to develop a cost structure And, a, and an actionable proposal. Yes. <laughs> For some reason, Jerry thought I was better suited to discuss this part of it. Uh, so a lot of discussion took place around what kind of a model might work for all these towns. And so with T. Rooks and the working groups uh, working together, they looked at uh, having a full-time in-office position a full-time remote position or a part-time in-office position. And they wanted to understand what the cost, cost and impacts of those different models might be. Um, they also um, reviewed different um, cost division scenarios that included a flat fee, a per capita, and a grand list. And uh, through all those meetings, um, the, the model settled upon was for a full-time remote position uh, utilizing the grand list to determine the cost divisions. Um, the benefit of the remote position is, as Jerry talked about earlier, uh, the cost for that will be less because it wouldn't have t Rock's overhead load on it because the person would not be housed at that location. Um, if I could ask Jeff a quick question, are you re remote or in office? So, it's hybrid. Yeah. So. Okay. 
So um, that's the one they, they settled on, was the full-time remote brand list approach. Next slide. Um, so they looked at full-time, which is 1,950 hours, 37 and a half hour work week. Um, with a remote, working from home, or in a town office if a town chose to provide an office for this position. Uh, compensation range would run from $44 to $60 an hour an annually. That's, I mean, uh, excuse me, per hour. And that's an estimate. Um, annual would be 86 to 117 k um, With T-ROC, T-ROC's involvement, providing some administrative support, the maximum um, with the, this administrative loan was determined to be about $125,000 per year, and it may be less. So how was the cost calculated? Um, well, as stated earlier, the grand list was used to determine the division of costs. Um, the, the task force felt that that was the most equitable way to distribute the cost without <coughs> pricing the program out of reach for any one town. Um, the maximum would be 125k per year with all the compensation and benefits and uh, uh, the administrative costs from TROC. Um, there is a potential of using uh, MERP funding uh, grants to offset first, first year costs if those have not been used. If MERP grants were used across all towns, that would reduce the 125 um, by 32,000 if, if they were available. Um, in the second year, once once this position is up and running, those uh, the cost per town may be off offset by savings generated by the program at that point. This next slide shows the seven participant towns that, that are still active. It shows um, what the year one cost would be with MERP funding included per town. For Randolph, it looks like 27500 if uh, we default to the year two, 125 k it would be 36800 for uh, fun, fun, funding from Randolph. Again, based on the uh, grand list. Why is Bethel going to put in 162000 Oh, excuse me. That, that's a typo. That should read 16,648. Yeah, Bethel would be surprised by that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if so we could pass that, that on, it would be great. <laughs> Jump in, we we'll take paid. that. We want that one. It's new accounting system. <laughs> there is a new math out there. Um, our share of it would give us about five, 585 hours of uh, workload dedicated, dedicated to Randolph from this position. Um, is that self that? envisioned to be self managed? I mean, if this, in other words, if if this person is reporting to a, an executive committee of representatives and energy committees of each of the seven towns, who is who are they responsible? For? How are they responsible for managing those hours? I guess I don't know the answer to yeah, that question. They have to document point. it monthly or something like that. That is a question we we could look into and answer yeah. for you. Just want to make sure that everybody gets there. Oh, but they don't have a boss. Hmm. We heard they don't have a boss. Right. Like right. that doesn't work. Management by committee doesn't work. I don't like that. Somewhere there's got to be. <laughs> I can tell you how I do. We do track. I do track hours now, and it's tracked by town and by program, and I submit a time card weekly mm -hmm. uh, who? with the hours to T Rourke. Yeah. With, so with, you have with, a boss, right? I have a boss. Yes. Two Rivers yeah. has a boss. Yeah. He has yeah. a boss. Oh, and yeah. your wife. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit problematic, too, because we know from our own experience that the, I don't want to say the quality, but the strength, oh, let's put it that way, the strength of the energy committees are going to vary from one town to another. So mm -hmm. you're going to have some towns that are more engaged and others that are less engaged. And I don't know how that how you respond to them. The way it's envisioned right now is it's it, it, this person isn't reporting to an energy committee in each town. It's a representative appointed by the town. Right. So uh, the energy committees would, would play a part, certainly. Yeah. But yeah. as far as um, the interface to this position, um, to the select board would run through this representative of the select board. Right, but that committee is only as good 
as it's it's, it's like the Beatles. You know, they were better than the sum of their parts. Uh, uh, it's often been said anyway. I'm just I'm just saying that 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 seven member committee, even if it is comprised of representatives of each town, it's a little hard for me to fathom how somebody. Well, we don't have anybody that reports to the select board either. We have Trevor that does right. to some extent, but you don't get very far if somebody needs day-to-day -day interaction, if they got to wait once a month for a board mm -hmm. meeting too. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's another tough management structure. Are you aware of how, how this was, was worked out? Had, or has no. it even gone that No, way? the details of what t works role would be have not been worked out. They're trying to see if they have an entity first before they've just told us about this remote status and um, I don't think it means they wouldn't necessarily have a boss if it means that they wouldn't be physically housed in the building and they might still have somebody would, would they conceivably be the fiduciary for the salary and benefits good question yes I think they would because none of the towns individually would be capable of doing that um, unless unless the one town stepped up to volunteer and just like Randolph didn't want to take on that role or several years ago no town is eager to take on that role mm -hmm. what happens if Randolph does it one year and doesn't want to do it after that yeah. then it does you just well doesn't yeah. that throw your whole pyramid into a tailspin sure the goal is 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 for this to be a success and to show some forward motion going into year two with with a clear understanding at that point that um, there are there are targets in the future that will um, bring great benefit to the town so it would be worthwhile for us to continue with this position if at the end of year one the towns don't reach that conclusion then of course it's up to each town to do what is best for that town. Then, then possible scenarios training could be downsize the position to three quarter or um, solicit or maybe be solicited by one of the other towns that's waiting in the wings to get in. I think these are pretty likely that the towns that are most likely to approve it. But there's other ones that just didn't follow through and are, once they hear about it, I think are going to want to get in on it if, they, if they're going to say, is it too late? I'm more concerned that the structure of this is at the whim of who gets elected to each of these select boards. So if you go to one that's looking at where they can cut costs and where they can do different things, or isn't as pro-energy, it's just a very fluid setup for it. Do you have, Jeff, do you, do you, do you have, uh, your, your position is split across six towns? It is, yeah, and it's very much like this. It's yeah. based on population, or, or, um, and you know the, the I think it, I should know that. I don't know exactly if it's population, but it basically is by the size of the town and how many. Um, it's, it's the same grand list. I've seen it. Okay. Yeah. So, do, do any of uh, the member towns um, have have any said we don't want the 100 hours we get from Jeff, we can get by with 50. Has that occurred and other towns can pick it up? Or no, no, yeah, we have had a town drop out, but it was a smaller town, so it had, you know, really didn't yeah. have any effect. But I'm a little, did, this position you said does not report through t -Rourke. It's remote, but t -Rourke is giving you some uh, administrative what, what oversight. Yeah. Oh, they are, oh, yeah. okay, I, okay. Yeah. I, I missed that part, mm -hmm. so. Can you highlight a little bit more about the difference between, and I don't know if Jeff's best to speak or how you all envision this being different than the planner role, which has similar responsibilities regionally? Do you want to cover that, Jeff, to talk about? I'm not sure I understand the question, sorry. So there is a slide that showed that this kind of evolved out of there is a planner, um, an mm -hmm. energy planner, mm -hmm. already at T Rope last year. Oh, for, um, for a different set yeah, of Yeah, so <coughs> what is the advantage of moving to this model versus continuing to have a regional planner? 
focused on energy. Those other models did not include Randolph, okay. nor did it include the, these other six towns as well. And nor is T work expressing interest in getting in hiring another one fully like Jeff. So, so how they, would the position differ? And maybe Jeff, you're in the best position to say this. You you are with T work. Mm -hmm. This position, the way it's presented here, would be administered by T work. What that means is yet to be determined. How would it it differ from your position? In other words, could T work be persuaded to hire another energy coordinator to take on these seven towns while Jeff is managing the six that he's for seven towns? That was my understanding of what would happen. So mm -hmm. um, I I guess I'm a little disconnected from where this committee went and came with this solution, but I thought that that was, you know, we've had talk there about an IREC too. Um, early on when I started the position, I've been there since February, so, you know, fairly new position, but similar work to what I've done in the past. But um, we had talked about, you know, what happens if other towns want to join. Um, we had towns, I think, started from this that had interest, so we talked about having an IREC too. Um, which would be exactly like what, you know, how it's set up now. Yeah. Um, yeah. The difference is, I think, what you've touched on. I, if, you know, I guess the model is that IREC, that T work would be the admin, but not the management of the position. So. Um, then who is, like, yeah. how does the position get priorities and. Well, I and think. De definition and leadership. Yeah, I mean, you know, even now, I mean, I, I'm, I have a manager at T-Work, but I really work for the towns. I work for the select boards, and, and I, work so that I, I work with the energy committees, but with the towns and the town manager. I work very closely with them, maybe as much or more as with the energy committees who come up with the ideas. And Tom was right on when he said there are certain towns that have very strong energy committees. I mean, we have professors from Dartmouth and, and some of our energy committees in towns that I work with. So a lot of the groundwork is done. Um, but they, you know, I mean, they, they're monitoring, what are the results? I mean, the results of this position basically are I'm saving energy or I'm getting grants for the town. Um, in many select boards, that's all they're looking at. Am I bringing money in? How much energy did you save this year? And how many grants did you bring in um, to work on projects? And. I do, I, you know, I'll go in front of the select boards and show what we've done. In fact, I'm sitting in front of Woodstock next week. Um, exactly that, what have you done this year? Um, and you can't really compare completely to the salary because a, a lot of it, I think, is um, educational. It's not purely grants that you bring in, but that's my goal is I try to make it easy for the select board to bring in um, either grant money or energy savings that more than cover what they're paying to have that position. And um, that's, if you, if you have a town that hasn't been really paying attention to that, that's relatively easy to do. And generally when you get those savings and energy, it's not just that one year that you get it, it's you're saving that energy year over year. So you can build on that. <coughs> But I think I'm getting off track. What was the question? No, no, I think you're right on track. Yeah, so, oh, good. Okay. So, so, so what I'm hearing is, or what I'm feeling is that this position, as proposed, would have more gravitas and impact potentially if it were directly tied to T. Rourke as uh, energy position two or whatever um, you want to call it. Um, I don't know, I, I just don't understand the rationale for it's not being, other than it's being remote, and plenty of people work remote in all kinds of different jobs, so that shouldn't be there. Well, let me to try to share what I heard from a T-Work employee who's, who I think not at the upper level, but what he, he conveyed to this multi-town committee, and I think I heard on two different times, but they would take on an, a, a, a second, a second Jeff, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but they said they were obviously not going how to do it, and I think they have requirements to um, share all of their overhead 
of the whole organization with any um, employee. And they calculated that it was going to be 50, about 50% more expensive for the seven towns if, if T Work just hired the person and totally managed the person. And also, they thought that we wouldn't actually get quite the responsiveness that the towns would get by them actively giving the person their their marching orders, their priorities. And so they seem to carve out this special status, and, and I sensed that's what we were being encouraged to do. Not that they wouldn't hire a, an IREC to, but they thought it would be more cost effective and maybe just what they'd prefer not to do it. And I, I can't say anything more because it's all unofficial, it's anecdotal, but it's certainly something that um, when this goes to the next level, we will need to get much more specific from T work. Yeah, some of that is, is news to me, so I, I don't have any inside information why it would be so much more expensive, other than um, I believe there was initial grants for this position when, when they started up the position. I think it was approved in 2019. Um, but there are overhead, and I think that if there if it would be more expensive, I would think that would be the reason is we do subsidize the part, the, right. the position at some point now, and that wouldn't apply to newer towns. But if we have a town drop out and somebody else comes in, I don't know. Yeah. So I, I, I sorry, I don't have any information on why that. I mean, is. Some place has to pay the payroll tax and the FICA and right. all yeah. of that. But so that appears to be minor. I think what they're saying is the overhead. Two right. rivers would then want to spread their overhead over that job too, mm. but that overhead shouldn't be that high. That's an extremely yeah, high Yeah, I'm not sure why it would be that much um, more. Don't, don't quote me on the no, 50%, but yeah. it was, you know. Plus my office is in a 200-year-old uh, farmhouse, so <laughs> you <laughs> I think we have huge overhead. I <laughs> brought up the schools, and the town government doesn't control the schools. Have you thought about adding the schools into this model too? We, well, yeah, and the way that Instead works now is if the select board and the energy committee wants me, you know, if they consider that part of their town, then we, we will work with them as part of the contract. But no, we haven't. That's actually not a bad idea. Um, it seems like it should be yeah. the town of Randolph and right. then they are definitely separate the supervisory entities. union. Right. And there's towns where we definitely work with the schools, and there's a few other towns where, no, we just want you to concentrate on our municipal operations. But so. I meant as another party in there. Yeah. Exactly. So you have yeah. the town, uh, and you have the yeah. school. Yeah. And yeah. Particularly given that this Randolph Union High School is the most occupied, you know, it's the largest number of people mm -hmm. in it between faculty and students. Yes. But they're also talking about building a new school, so they aren't going to put a lot of money or energy into it. Yeah. Fixing this school. Well, that new school will be years and years out. And it could be good to have somebody focused on energy and getting energy grants yeah. to go into planning for the new Absolutely. schools. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Stowe just voted down a $39 million um, school bond on Tuesday night, and Woodstock's looking at an $80 to $85 million one next March. Um, and I would think uh, 80, you know, having an energy, uh, a professional energy facilitator, whatever you want to call it, I rec, folding those entities in to this kind of approach would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I've, I've heard two, two big concerns. One is how is the position to be managed? The other is what, what happens if a town drops out? Um, certainly we need to have more detail as to uh, you know, the role of, of this person with interfacing with town's chosen interface, which also works with the select board. Is, was there anything else top of mind that... I think you should look at adding the schools in. Adding schools in. And right, then the right other thing that. I think was how, how you monitor the hours. If, like, if the, your splitting up the cost of it according to the grand list, but you're allowing a town to, to end up with a certain number of hours. It almost feels like you should be, it should be more of a rate per hour and the town could opt in for what they want for hours. And I think um, I would also add, uh, so you have 
one grant that you're looking or funding that could bring down costs, but what if other grants came along that could have admin costs included, and what would that look like if, like, where do those admin costs go? Would they go to T York or? Um, if our portion of it was $36,000, I, 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 I would say I, I'd assume that grant would go towards reducing that level from Randolph. Right, so just Randolph figuring out got the I, grant. I think it could quickly get. Yeah, I don't know how, how it would work with, with towns funding T Rock if T Rock, for instance, manages this position. I, I don't know what that. that uh, you know, then there's also the is. question of who's managing the grant, who's doing the reporting, so all of that, too, and that's, that's something that sort of needs that. to be addressed. Jeff, do you have a grant? Yeah. yeah. We do, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. We'll do project management and grant management as part of this project, so. Yeah. Do you put that, is that built into the grant so that you get that project management fee? It should be, that? yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's it, the, the grant is done by the town, and you know, again, they'll direct me to work on that, but that is part of what, um, the, what we do. But, um, yeah, I mean, I would assume that's put in the grant, it should be, but they're, they're paying me to manage, so if they allow it, right? Yeah, because some of them allowed, have your exactly. admin yeah. at 5,000, yeah. yeah. yeah, but that's one you of the advantages, worth of admin. right? Yeah. So that's the other potential of bringing the cost down is if the position is actually successful in getting grants, that it would cost all the towns less. Sure. Right. Yeah, and an advantage of having this position is that they take some responsibility off the town. They, they'll manage the project, they'll get the grants, they'll manage the grants. Um, and yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> Make sure the project's the done. Not be on a time. direct savings yeah. on the position cost, though. You may get a grant that helps replace a heating system right. or something like that. Mm -hmm. So your savings are over on your facility line item versus on your actual right. fee so, that you pay here. But I think there's a potential. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of federal energy money out there. The yeah. goal would certainly, you know, <laughs> the, the, would would be for the cost benefit to um, exceed. That thirty-six thousand. That certainly would be the goal of any town. Would be to exceed that cost with, with the cost benefits that the position would, would bring. And the the challenge is comparing it to the cost that we would have incurred anyway versus new costs in, the, in changes, right? So it's on energy cost savings, but if we're going and replacing a heating system that we wouldn't have had to replace anyway, and you're, you've got a match and whatnot, it's then kind of, you gotta, it's, it's all costing you some more to have that position to do that work. So, yeah, we can all manipulate the numbers any way we want to, but. Okay. Go to the next slide. Oh, try again. Uh, where it is. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the benefits of this position. I've, I've got this slide here. Okay, we've got to wrap this up because we've got a lot. So um, we'll you know, the summary of benefits, we, we yeah. save dollars across towns, we increase the town's capacity, okay. you help meet statewide benchmarks, you, you, you mitigate the risks of oil dependency, not oil dependency itself. Share knowledge across towns, you reduce conflict between municipalities and, and volunteers, uh, provide greater resources for residents, thereby serving them better. Um, sharing volunteer power across the towns will strengthen the, the capacity of each town. Um, how do we become a, a White River ERC town? Um, one is to establish a structure assign a volunteer representative. Um, the representative wouldn't necessarily have to live in the town. We'd have to eventually approve funding um, in each town and, and add it to the town's meeting agenda. Um, based on how presentations go at select boards over the next month, the towns in this group, the participants, may shift, making small changes to the percentages shared by each town. 
we expect to have a firm figure for budgeting purpose in December. What we have presented is, um, in, in review with you, is broad stroke estimates and concept. Um, so the question is, based on, on what you've heard tonight, um, is the select board interested in our continuing to move forward, developing this model, and firming up and answering the questions that you've asked tonight? Um, uh, enough for us to come back and do an, uh, an additional re re review with you. In a nutshell, have you heard enough to make you interested to hear more? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I certainly I think we have. I, I think my biggest concern is just clarifying what exactly the administration role is of, of T work, and then <clears throat> I really do think there needs to be a, a you know a buck stops here, Harry Truman kind of person that this person reports to, whoever that might be or whatever entity that might be. It just it just feels too. That's the word I want. Squishy. Build defined. The right <laughs> employee could thrive in that environment, but the wrong employee could just be a disaster and do yeah. more damage to you than it's yeah. going to do good. Yeah, I mean, you need something that's very self directed in any case, but they also need to have their head screwed on it, too. Yeah. So. By somebody else. <laughs> well, <laughs> you yeah, need to be checking in with somebody. I wouldn't dispute any, any, any of those things. These are all great great things that, yeah. that you brought up. I'm glad we had this meeting because these are questions that weren't apparent to the group. Um, mm -hmm. So it's important to have these answered. So thank you very much for your time. And um, hopefully we can come back in December and, and walk through it again with greater detail. Okay. Thank you. I think the other question that we're going to have to answer as a board is if you could add a position and labor hours, would that be where you would add them? Because we've heard Trevor talk about need help with managing grants, not energy grants necessarily, but the, the capacity that we have right now to do the workload that we have isn't there. So if you were going to add labor hours, is that where you would add the labor hours? That'll come up in the budget discussions. All right. Um, we are all over the place, aren't we? Let's go back to the top. Did we have the member of Two Rivers here to talk about the grant proposal? Looks like there is one. Kevin is not here. Kevin. Sydney Steinman. She's here for zoning. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, I, I don't see Kevin and I don't have a note. I just checked real quick in my inbox. And did, we'll just sort of didn't you mention that he had to be in two places at once at some point? Yeah. 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 All right, so we'll go to the introduction and review of the proposed zoning bylaw amendments. I'm not going to out. Who is so you think, Sydney, that might yep. be you. I was just getting everything set up. Um, Hello everybody, thank you for having me. Um, I know Jeff is in the room too, he's on our planning commission. Um, he was vital to all of this get put together. Um, so Randolph has a bylaw modernization grant as part of a group of other towns who went on, uh, went in on the application together uh, to increase the odds of you actually getting it. Um, the bylaw modernization grant was to improve how the uh, Randolph plant use regulations treat housing um, and to kind of in turn or in addition bring it up to speed with the town plan since the bylaws were last updated prior to the new town plan being adopted or the new urban town plan being adopted. Um, so that wasn't grant money, but that is something that we did while we were in there just because you kind of have to when you change things in the town plan. Um, the land use regulations are derived from that document, so it has to be in agreement with it. So um, while we were in there, we also addressed 
changes made by the Act 148 um, or S100, Senate Bill S100, which addressed housing in Vermont and made some mandatory changes. So when that came out and when we got that guidance, we made those changes in Randolph's land use regulations as well. Um, the major changes were adding some language more specifically about accessory dwelling housing units um, and exempting them from zoning permits. Uh, they're allowed by, by right now uh, because of S100, so any single family or um, duplex can have an accessory dwelling unit by right. Uh, we added a little language about how those would be permitted or when they require permits. Uh, there was added a cottage court um, development type, uh, which shows up in the zoning tables. Uh, it is designed with input from the Planning Commission and uh, in conjunction with other towns developing something similar. It's designed to allow for a development that's not apartments, but it's kind of cottages on one lot um, surrounding an open central court. Uh, another major change, it's got its own uh, language. It's, it's something that could be done with a PUD, um, planned unit development, but calling it out specifically as something that has its own defined way of proceeding would make it easier to do than with the planned unit development sequence of events that would have to happen to submit that. Um, another significant change, I'm just going to go over a couple, uh, a couple more, is affordable housing language. So in section 304 of the land use regulations, there's a waivers from dimensional requirements subsection. Um, on affordable housing and language was added to allow affordable housing projects without sewer and water, you know, more density with sewer and water, even more density. Some of that is derived from S100 and some of it is just trying to encourage as much affordable housing as we can, especially in areas with sewer and water. Um, so that's going to be essential to creating and maintaining the number of units. Uh, I think of what else. Um, added some definitions to the plan and then not related to housing but related to um, plan changes. The town plan had combined a number of I guess zoning districts in the bylaws uh, but land use areas in the town plan they uh, combined the INC districts, the, which there were four, and now it's just one. The boundaries of that changed a little bit. Rural, residential, and rural agricultural, uh, agricultural were combined by the town plan, and um, East Randolph and North and South Randolph village areas were also combined by the town plan, so that's reflected in the new, uh, in the proposed Randolph land use. So I guess that's my brief overview. Uh, I think the select board has the changes document that I put together that outlines all of these. Um, do you have any questions or Jeff, do you want to add anything? No, thanks. Um, just the very high level overall um, idea with this was to address the housing shortage in Vermont and just try to encourage more um, development and housing units in the village where the infrastructure exists for water and sewer. So that that was the overall um, goal was um, just to make um, some required lots a little bit smaller, um, make it easier for people to get permits to, to have ADUs in their buildings and to have smaller um, units maybe on their property. But basically it was to help address the housing shortage. And then like you said, we did along with that some um, just 
paper, you know, make, making sure that the um, land use regulations match the town, or that the town, I'm going to get that backwards. That the land use regulations make, match the town plan. Yes, thank you, yes. Yep. So that, that was the overall, uh, you know, just high level. And then, as you can see, there's plenty of details that we went over in months and months. The, the, the bylaws grant that we got were, were part of the what, seven town grant or whatever. That preceded S100, didn't it? And then S100 came along and sort of has driven this process even more yeah. quickly. Would that be accurate to say? Uh, yeah. and, and these changes um, that we just heard about are consistent with what is required of us or with the spirit of S100? Yeah, yeah. And mo most of the, all the affordable housing changes, as far as I, I recall, and, uh, and some of the other changes in, in encouraging housing were required changes that, yeah, that's that, exactly that, right. that are yeah. far, uh, in a result of S100. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's our action step here? What's the action, City? Where do we go from here? I think we've got uh, to get a schedule. Oh. Is there a public forum that needs to be held or something? Yes, or? there is. Which I think is the deadline because there there was a. I don't know what that deadline means by the. the does, was there a public hearing that had to be held by a certain time and then these implemented by a certain time? Um, so, so tell me what the, I'm not sure what the deadline means exactly, but I had worked on a timeline with the planning commission and it ended up being really tight on the select board. So I've had some back and forth uh, with the select board and town manager on this to revise the timeline to give the select board more time to review. There's not really an action step uh, to my knowledge at this meeting uh, beyond the select board meeting to review. Um, the document and have a <coughs> solid discussion on it at future meetings or a future meeting. Um, I believe the <coughs> kind of draft or working timeline right now has the select board reviewing it at the December 9th meeting. Um, beyond that, I don't really remember. I don't think it's right now. But there um, wasn't enough time. We got it and had yeah. five or six days to try to digest all that and talk about whether we wanted any changes made to the right. language. So <clears throat> yeah. it was a presentation <coughs> at the December meeting. We will have had time, or it should have had time by then to read it and see if they like the language or want to change it. And then we notice it for the public hearing. Mm -hmm. And then after the public hearing, we make a decision of adopting or not adopting. And we can make minor changes from what I understand after the public hearing and still adopt it. But if it's anything that's considered a major change, and I guess we can decide if it's a major change, right? Uh, it goes back to the Planning Commission to bring back here again. It so, goes back into the 30 day movement. But there's a lot of changes in there, and there was no way we were going to be able to. I had no time to digest all that in <coughs> three days. So. Sure. I didn't think anybody else did, unless you wanted to just live and breathe zoning regulations and town plan for a few days. <laughs> I've, I've looked at at least one of these in another town as recently as this afternoon, and just by flipping through this, it looks like a lot of it is just consistent with the demands of S1. Um, I'd, I'd say the, the vast majority is, is, is either that or having our town plan and our land use regulations, you know, say the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. not that people should look over it carefully, but I think what we'll find is that most of it is, is really, it falls yeah. into no-brainer land. Like right. Either we have to do it, or it, it makes sense given right. things that we've already said as a town that right. we are in favor of. So it's, it's almost more like we're, we're not approving these, we're just, determining the consistency with both the new state regulations and our own town plan. Right? There's, not, there's not things we can necessarily oppose in here, correct? There, there's a couple of things, like, like Sydney said, there's the cottage court development, which we included, which is new. 
Um, but as she pointed out, it, it's 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 new in that it didn't exist before in our land use regulations. Mm -hmm. But it's not new in the sense that someone could have done this otherwise. It just provides an easier format for a potential developer to go through to to make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, and the other, I think, if I remember correctly, the only other significant change is the reduced minimum lot size in the, um, in, the, in the village district, which we've reduced significantly. Does everybody have some light reading? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 it's, not, it's not that bad. Great. No, it is. Thank it's, you, Sydney. It's all pretty straightforward. Thank you. Next up Thank is. Uh, police service committee update and deadline extension request. You got that, Trevor? Or... You're, uh, you're on roll there. I'm going to wait and see if All right. So the police committee met um, again last night, or Tuesday night, and there is no way we're going to have uh, everything wrapped up by December 1. Um, so there is going to be a public forum. It will be November 28th. At six o'clock, and hopefully it'll be at BTC. I really have contacted them about that, so we have a few options. And so, um, the select board is going to be invited to be there to hear all the data, everything that's come out of this, um, and the information. What is going to be presented are the three options. There's not going to be any committee decision until after the public forum to allow members of town to weigh in on what they want to see. Um, the three options are leave it the way it is, expand the district up towards Randolph Center and south uh, towards Bethel, or go townwide. And it'll go over the costs of each, the, the impacts, you know, that it's all the way from right sizing the existing, sort of what the service demands are to a townwide structure, which is obviously going to be the, the highest cost one, right? Because you got to have a building and some things like that that'll weigh into that. But all that'll go, we'll go over, talk about some of what the demands are that they're seeing and whatnot. Um, but then once that is over, there's two meetings scheduled to bang out the final report and recommendations and bring it to the select board. So, so the, the forum's on the 28th? Yes. So the original deadline was for December 1. It's looking more like a January 1 or a mid-December if we're really good. Uh, I'm thinking it's going to be the January 1. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and so we just want to bring it back and give you an update and tell you where we're going to be. Because um, one way or another, this is going to have some level of impact on the budget and on the budget development, whether it's, um, you know, some of the conversation was around, we may need to take this in steps. You know, it may not be a one time, here, here we go to what the final is. So um, it's hard to say what the impact of the budget is going to be until we get through after the public forum and hear what folks want and what their reaction is to, to what's been put together. So what, what time is the form? Six o'clock, but I don't know the location for sure yet. Potentially BTC. <laughs> Potentially BTC. Yeah, it, we got a line on the, I forget, it's like a, it sounds like a Auditory. auditorium style venue up at BTC. And then she mentioned about a hundred oh. seats. And she emailed me back today too and said something about the schoolhouse too, depending on what we want. Schoolhouse, schoolhouse has system. accessibility issues too. Oh, okay. <coughs> it's very small. We don't want to do that. Okay. Yeah, but it's but no terms, big room. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not big enough. Yeah, the auditorium seats are hundred. The upstairs, yeah, which is probably plenty. Yeah. I just have to get back to her about it. I mean, there's a decision there. Yeah, we don't want the schoolhouse. Okay, that's we'll go to the other one. <laughs> Whatever the other option was. Right. That's where that is. So if anybody has any challenges and wants a report, hey, this is the one. Probably isn't going to happen. 
I won't say it's because of lack of effort. We have had a lot of meetings and it's a pretty good conversation and a lot of data has come out, a lot of comparables, a lot of, it's just not an easy nut to crack. We don't need a motion to extend. No. Do, do you think that the, well, you two of us on the committee, do you think that ultimately following the forum, the decision will be won by consensus or? Well, as I mentioned, I, I guess it depends on where you're going, right? So yeah, well, you, I think it's possible. I mean, I think it depends how it goes. I think everybody's pretty open. They're, they're trying to understand all sides of it and mm -hmm. what's out there. It's possible. But there was a, a question that's already been asked if there could be a dissenting opinion. So, so and, the Supreme Court. And yes, <laughs> and, you know, that's fine too, you know. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it'll come in as a consensus. Yeah. There was a mention of coming to the select board with lists of concerns too. I'm just kind of well, the things that aren't part of that, that are ongoing things that the, the, that are not going to be met by a law enforcement budget. Mm -hmm. You know, the wraparound services. Somebody has an incident and law enforcement does their part, but they need some type of social service to follow on. Mm -hmm. you know, what what does that look like and who should be you know, there was a lot of conversation about the Clara Martin Center has funding for some of that and whatnot. So who kind of takes it from that point and helps form that wraparound service to <coughs> provide people with the full picture and mm -hmm. we kind of set it over in this like other things because we have our hands full with what we've got. So it's identifying that it's kind of gone outside of of what we were assigned to do and what law enforcement would do, but it is something that's out there and is a need and somebody should be focusing on it. So, yeah, it's a fun one. All right, next up we have the East Valley Community Group building funding proposal. Hi, um, I'm Peggy Whitemeck. I'm a member of the East Valley Community Group, and I'm here with um, the president of our uh, group, which is Betsy Race, and with Josie Carruthers. These are other members of our committee uh, also. Uh, Josie Carruthers, Mark Kelly, uh, John Pimentel, and um, we wanted to present uh, this evening um, a proposal, but we wanted to start with a little bit of the history because we've been here a couple of times uh, speaking with the select board and I always have a sense that we're sort of, there's a disconnect somehow um, between what's going on in East Randolph and what's going on in the, in the main town and there are so many projects and responsibilities and priorities that Randolph proper, the town of Randolph has, that it's, it's sometimes overwhelming, I think, uh, for the town. And so, you know, what's going on in the burgs, you know, the East Randolph and the other, um, South Randolph, et cetera, et cetera, um, sometimes kind of gets lost in the shuffle because there's just so much going on in the center of town. Um, we did discover um, a memorandum of understanding that was executed in 2016 and 2017 um, that sort of uh, explicitly addresses the connection between the East Randolph Community Hall, which is the main concern that we have as a group, um, and the town of Randolph. And so I wanted to just share this memorandum with you all uh, this evening. <clears throat> As kind of a, a basis, kind of a historical starting point for... Watch out for the cables. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And you're welcome. Okay. Better go the other way. Gotta go the other way. Yeah. 
challenge you? Okay. No. Hold this up. <laughs> um, what I wanted to call your attention to, especially in this memorandum of understanding, oops, looks like I gave away all my copies of it. Oh, here. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give it back to you. I'm good. Um, the town responsibilities that were uh, articulated at that point for the East Valley Community Hall were the town of Randolph, um, this is number two, I'm just going to read that, that section. The town's responsibilities, the town of Randolph shall take responsibility for maintaining the grounds surrounding the building with snow removal, lawn mowing and trash removal services, providing building repairs and capital improvements as needed to meet safety and legal requirements, including the heating system, roof, foundation, handicap, accessibility, septic, etc., paying for year-round utilities such as propane and electricity, purchasing cleaning supplies and toiletries for building use, working with the hall committee, which is now the hall committee that is now the East Valley Community um, group. And um, uh, let's see, working with the hall committee to develop new uses and programs in the hall, providing a stipend and or hourly payment to hall committee members, which we have not, we have not requested that and it's not, we're not particularly interested in that. Um, providing some operating budget for hall projects as developed by the committee and continuing to administer use of the hall, including but not limited to bathrooms, meeting areas, and chief's office to be accessible to the East Randolph firemen. So there's a, there's a, uh, a, a real connection between the, the fire department next door and, and the, the hall. And then the town shall receive 100% of building rental income and shall manage all deposits. Right now, that's not happening. <laughs> um, we're managing, the group is managing the deposits. Um, we have some funds that we've already raised for, for this project. And so we've been, um, we've just been amassing that, that amount so that it, until at such time as we can do something with it. We have about, um, I believe, about $37,000 right now in the fund. So um, that's kind of the, the history that, for me, it was very helpful to find this um, memorandum of understanding, because I, I, I was always like really confused about the relationship between this project and the town of Randolph. Um, so, having given you that um, kind of basic understanding of the history that brought us to this point, um, I'm going to uh, ask Betsy Race to, uh, to talk about the work that we're doing right now, which is we're, we're working on developing a request, request to the town to warn an article for the 2024 town meeting agenda concerning the hall restoration. So Betsy will take it from here. So our capital campaign funding committee has decided we, um, we, it's time to see where the town's going to help with the restoration. Um, this is document that shows what we have to be able to use the hall again, have it bearing income for the town rather than just expense. And this is all based on the assessments from the federal architect uh, engineers that came in earlier. And what year did they come in? The 90s? Because I don't think you need to. Yeah. Um, so these numbers are like not even valid. They're, saying they're probably double or two and a half times what's on your paper. Well, no, it was uh, already it well into, no, no. into COVID times. To, to be determined. Yeah. Was, to be determined, but it's right not that are almost 100% increase of last year's numbers even. So I bet you're pretty close. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we can't we, know, so we'll just keep on going ahead with the, the numbers that we have, which are the best that we can do right now mm -hmm. that has been done. So if you're going to put it before the voters, they need to So we discussed this with Trevor, 
Jill, uh, Peggy and I did, and that's someone we requested to be on the meeting. Mm -hmm. We also discussed it with Kelly Green, your moderator, uh, figuring out a process for getting this on the town meeting agenda for 2024. Uh, there are apparently different avenues. One's a bond vote. Um, one is actually asking the taxpayers for money, and they're assessed at that amount of money. It's not a bond, it comes in straight from tax. Mm -hmm. And there may be others, I don't know. But we're bringing it to you because we think it's time. Um, the grants that we have been working on, almost all of them require the project to be in, pro the project to be in process. Mm -hmm. It's like, you got to have something. If you get the money, you got to be able to spend it in a year. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to put money towards a lift when you haven't even got the foundation done. That kind of thing. Um, some of it has been they need um, matching money from the municipalities and um, when we talked to Trevor about it, he said that he, it was really difficult to even do anything with grant money because he just didn't have the time as far as municipality. Um, so we kind of wonder what you're thinking about. We know that there's a way to put a petition out there, get a certain amount of signatures to have this put on the agenda. The town meeting agenda, and that may be what the do reason you mean by the agenda. The like, so an article want. on the agenda to be voted on. The warrant. Okay, so on the warrant. The warrant. The warrant. Is a on the warrant. Not the uh, no, no. Okay. Yep. Okay. So the, uh, my understanding is those are the two paths. The petition is one pathway for getting a warrant. Yep. And the other is for us to put. It and I, I just wanted to emphasize that we butted our heads against a lot of grant makers and all of the, the larger grants and the federal grants and so forth that are request, requiring a cost share by the town to own some building. It's just we can't get most of these larger grants unless we have a cost share. Okay, the, the, because the town owns the building. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to, right? Because we had this conversation a few times about yeah. either giving it back to your group or yeah. another organization. Why to don't own you it put that out there? Something like that. If that's something we, you want to do as a town, why don't you put it right out there on building for sale? We can. I mean, I don't. I know you say that. I know you say that, and so then we go back as a committee saying, well. This building? Are we are we asking people for money and then nothing's going to happen? What are we going to do? We have to give the money back to them? We need some direction from the town. It's your building. We need some direction from you. It's actually our building. I mean, it's the town's it's building. The town yeah, owns yeah, it yeah. on behalf of the people. Right. I want to make one one more point while you're deliberating. And I want you to consider the East Valley. Three of Randolph's five villages are there. And we have right now a building that is, has had some investment since the town took it over in 2017. Um, but the town closed it down and just for the sake of Stephanie and Alyssa, because you may not know too much about it, what happened was the town, uh, a former town manager, saw the need for community gathering space. Most towns do have some sort of community center. Our town does not. And uh, there's been talk of <coughs> having some form of a community center for a number of years now. And so the what we have is a building that was deeded over to the town, at the, which process was initiated by a former town manager, 
um, with the idea, we had to go around to the voters in the East Randolph Fire District who owned the building at the time and ask them to vote yay or nay on deeding the building over to the town. We explained at the time, because I was part of this, Mark was part of this, and so on, that the town, we, we shared with them the proposed memorandum of understanding in, its, in an overall view that the town would maintain this building, um, that it would be put to community use. Unfortunately, what happened was that uh, the town insurer saw that there were code violations and once it became town property that needed to be addressed, so the town had to close the building right away. So it's been closed since July of 2017. That's, what's that, eight years ago. And um, we're still getting consistent calls. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce is getting consistent calls. We talked to, talk to Andrea Easton about it. She's kind of gung-ho on getting this building reopened because of what she knows uh, about the need for rental space, for reunions, concerts, you know, there's community has needs for such a building. Um, so just to wind up here, we have a building that is deteriorating steadily in East Randolph, and as the building goes down, the village looks pretty bad, um, and it's not a wholesome environment. We spruce it up. We put up flower displays and holiday decorations and so on, and we you know, work to have events there like bingo and so on. Um, to the small extent that we can use the building, we do. Halloween. Um, pardon me? And Halloween. And Halloween, that's right, um, which is very successful. Um, our mission is to revitalize community in the East Valley. That's three of the Randolph's villages plus East Brookfield. So, is I, I would I would almost go out on a limb and say as that building goes to a certain degree goes East Randolph in terms of vitality, morale, property values, and so on. If the building is restored and becomes the community hub that people have expressed desire for repeatedly, even eight years later. Then we see more traffic to the store, we see more uh, attention being paid to the houses in the village, we see that whole process that you're all familiar with known as revitalization. That's what we stand for, that's what we were founded to do, was to work to revitalize and unite the East Valley and generate a sense of community belonging, sense of place, uh, and frankly, a little more optimism, because that is what forms the basis of resilience. We're looking to have support for our efforts at community resilience throughout the East Valley. In Vermont, community halls are, you know, one of our sacred places. It's where we build our community, our culture. It's what brings people together. Um, it's what, you know, enables us to be bound together in good times and bad times. And right now we don't have a community hall here in Randolph. And we especially don't have any municipal buildings over in East Randolph that could serve South Randolph and North Randolph. So this, this, this building is more than just a building. It's, it's um, representative of the soul of the community. And right now it needs, it needs some, some tender loving care. That's what's going to, you know, continue to bind us and help us to continue to build a culture that makes living in Vermont a special, uh, a special thing for all of us. I'll add one brief thing, which was that two prior town managers wanted the revitalization of the hall in order for it to serve as an emergency shelter, supply depot, and so on. Since those town managers have been around, We've had our natural disaster over there in the East Valley. And, uh, and it, was, it was a humdinger for some of us. Uh, and um, if the scientists are right that such things will be happening more frequently and with greater fierceness, we're going to need that. We need emergency facilities in the East Valley for those three villages. 
you, no matter which process by which you get on the warrant for town meeting with, and that's your objective here. Um, do you plan to tell the voters in advance as you're advocating for this plan what your plan is for the long-term management? I don't know if it's talking about the town keeping the facility up and all of that. Who's going to be um, booking the hall? Who's going to be scheduling events there? I mean, I'm thinking about a role model right down the street here, if I may, and that's just the Chandler Center for the Arts, mm -hmm. which the town passed a bond for in about, what, 2001, maybe? $750,000. Mm -hmm. um, and a nonprofit organization was established to manage the facility. They, in a sense, lease it from us. We just renewed the lease last year for 20 more years. Um, mm -hmm. But we have a very limited, um, we the town have a very limited role in paying for, for example, the heating and electricity and all those kinds of things. The Chandler Center for the Arts raises the money through fundraising and through programming and through grantsmanship to keep that place open. Mm -hmm. And so are, are you up? to telling the people of Randolph that you're ready to meet that challenge, I guess. Are we, are we ready to hit the ground run, running, much like Chandler? Of mm -hmm. course not. Yeah. Because no. we've got a building in, in disrepair, and, and, no. And, no. And, and, and so we haven't got that organization in place. Could we do it in the long term? Sure. Yeah. We absolutely could. We, we, we are a nonprofit entity, the East Valley Community Group. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a set of officers and, and structure. So, you know, we could take that on. Yeah. And we have a business plan for yeah. running it once it's repaired. And I, I'm operated. just making the point that you're not just selling this right. plan to us. You're going right. to need to yep. be able Thank to you. sell it to the voters, too, regardless of how it makes its way to the warrant. Right. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate your question. It's, and it is something that we have discussed without fleshing it out, because we're so focused on getting a building. But we understand that uh, that we're still going to have an involvement, a major involvement with this building, which is why we prepared the business plan at the select board request um, a few months ago. And I've and I've been doing some grant writing, in, you know, uh, in the interim. And the, the the obstacle that I'm running up against is that um, we're not ready to start doing anything with the money we get. Uh, because we don't, you know, we don't have the, the, the basic support we need to, to get things going. We, we don't have the relationship with you, with you, the select board, that allows us to see our way. It's just a fog, and we've been at this for seven years, as some of you will recall. Capital fundraising, grant writing, you know, that's, that's in the DNA of, of the East Valley Community Group organization. That, that's an assumption that that need and that function is always going to be in place, um, you know, to raise money to restore the building and manage it. That, that, that's already in our DNA. And if we can get some funds from the town, then that opens a lot of doors for mm -hmm. getting a lot more money. For donors. I can't speak for anyone else, but I think the bond route is a lot, um, a lot more possible path for you than a, a, a taxpayer you know, assessment or whatever other option you suggest is That's just do the, do the math seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars assuming that this holds true um, in today's dollars by what thirty five hundred people maybe how many, how, many, how many people do we have on the ground? We, we did some calculations ourselves on, on that. Um, we were talking about, yeah, it, it, as much as uh, I think as well. Trevor gave us a 13 cents per hundred. Some, somewhere Something in like that, that range. Yeah. Somewhere in that range. And that was be, 
and I know you're going through an assessment. Oh, I just, That's based on before we start throwing math around, I just want to clarify that was some back of the envelope calculations based on just to a straight oh, yeah. number. Nobody should plan anything with that. Okay. Right. Right. Very estimate. I just want that okay. right there. Okay. No, I appreciate that, uh, Trevor, because that, he, Trevor made that clear that that was just an estimate. Mm -hmm. Nobody's being held to anything, but we just, we do, of course, we, we are, intend to be responsible and have an understanding of if we're going to ask the town citizens, as, as well as ourselves, for money, we have to know what we're talking about here, um, so that uh, we don't want to burden people either. We, we just, we think that, that, that the building of a, of a resilient community requires some investment on the part of the town that is building its resilience. And we over in the East Valley, we're taxpayers too. Um, and you put the populations of East, North, and South Randolph together, um, we're not that small a fraction of the total tax revenue of the town. And we see, you know, to a certain degree, we can see our, our community's economic fortunes fluctuate according to the fate of this building. We have got new businesses in East Randolph, too, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, the, you've heard of the Bethel University. There's someone that's been talking to me about wanting to do a Valley University if we ever get the hall open. There's a lot. There's a lot out there that can be done with it. It was never done in the past. Okay. We also, if if I could take a mo uh, another moment, we'd we'd also like to urge the town to um, hire a part-time grant manager. Um, I, I You're just here looking for money everywhere. <laughs> 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 I'm looking for a way for this town to pull money in right? Yes. and save money. Yes. That's my goal. It's not to spend money, it's to raise money. And I yes. think we can do that by hiring a part-time grant manager. I had the opportunity to talk to Gary Mullen. I think you know him. He's on the select board in, Tun in Tunbridge. He was hanging the field next to me yesterday, so I had a conversation with him. And I don't bring this up to say, you know, to, to say this select board's doing this, why aren't we? I'm just using it as a data point of, of what might be possible. This past year, they hired a part-time grant manager. She works five to six hours a week um, at $30 an hour. And I, I asked Gary, how's that working out? And he said, on a scale of one to 100, it's 150. He said he couldn't be more pleased with the performance. Um, she works with T-Rourke in, in, in managing grants that they help bring forward uh, our, our for grants and so forth. And uh, he says it's just working out fantastically over there and the cost is, is small. Um, so, you know, it's our recommendation that, that the town hire a part-time grant manager. We know of some that live here in this town that, that would be interested. Um, because the opportunities are there to, to pull more money into the town at very little expense. And, and you know, if we don't give things like this a shot, we're, we're never gonna know um, if, 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 if it works. This is a, a low dollar risk to, with great potential follow on, money's come, coming in. It's low risk to spend this kind of money to hire a part-time grant manager. The, op the opportunities are uh, too great to pass up, in my view. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we, we strongly urge the town to consider that. That would go hand in hand with working with groups like the East Valley Community Group, enabling us to apply for more grants, manage more grants, um, raise more money. Um, then we wouldn't be talking to the town about kicking in tax dollars. We'd be talking to the town about helping us pull a grant into 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 the town. We'd work on get the on getting the matching funds if, if that's required for the grant, and then. Um, you know, we, we, with, with this person and, and work, working with the town, the management could be taking care of that grant. You know, to, to me, it seems like a no-brainer. 
to, to pursue something it, like this. Some of what it, you were talking about, the grant writing wasn't the challenge, it was the project management. Well, the, uh, managing the grant. One no, it was managing the project. The grant is a different piece of it. Managing the project to get it to the point where grant funders were interested seemed to be where the challenge was. Sure, it's from a what challenge. I was hearing before, versus the actual grant writing and mm -hmm. right. You said you were meeting, talking with grant or grant <coughs> folks mm -hmm. that managed the handing out the money, but their issue was your project wasn't to the point yet where they were interested in biting. So well, for example, it doesn't sound to me like it's the actual grant writing side of it as much. And I'm not saying it's not a good idea, but I think on your side, your problem is you don't have the, the project management to bring it to the point where it's ready to go for the funders to be interested in jumping on board. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. well, well, it's, it's not, not that's a challenge that doesn't no, have to be No, it's not, just, not it at all. It's not just that. It's some of it is, well, the town owns the building. What are they doing? Well, nothing right now, but uh, wouldn't you still like to contribute? You know? <laughs> and. It's hard to answer that question. For example, it's we, an uncomfortable we were shortlisted for Bernie Sanders' earmark last year. For $750,000. Uh, or $800,000, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons we didn't get it, was that the town had shown no support to the project. What, what, kind, of, what kind of showing of support would, would, would be? No, this, I mean, it's the town has to. You really have to come up with some money. How much money? That, that that's that's a very large. You know, if we can begin to genuinely talk about it, then let's begin to talk about it. We didn't come to this meeting prepared for some very specific financial uh, conversation, but we can. Well. And I, I think that it's a mistake to think that we have not uh, engineered the process sufficiently to have a genuine conversation with large grantors, because that's not the case. As, as you know, we did get uh, the Red Loaf Architectural Corporation to come in and give us a very, very detailed assessment of everything. Of, you know, and, and we've, we've massaged that in terms of what's realistic for us to do when. We've talked about phases for the project, phases of funding. Um, but what we, we, we've been operating it's, it, by ourselves in a little playpen. Every time we've tried to get out of the playpen, we haven't met with receptive, receptivity on the part of the select board that let us out and let's have real conversations about a genuine community. It can be an asset or a liability. We're trying to transform this building into an asset, a money bringing in asset. We're not trying to suck the town dry of funds at all. We're all taxpayers here. None of us are wealthy. And so there was some outreach from Sanders' office in the oh, earmark yeah. funds, and it came down to a decision for the town of whether we had drinking water and the grant for the drinking water system or the town hall and the, we went with the drinking water. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what, why the grant didn't come, the earmark didn't come. It didn't have anything to do with the town not putting in money or any of that. It had to do with, we had to choose between two projects that the earmark mm -hmm. could come in for and we went with the drinking water. And when we met with Trevor, he made that clear that, you know, I mean, as, as things stand right now, if we did nothing, it would be another 10 years before we could even, before the select board would be in a position to be able to allocate any money to this project because there's so many other urgent needs. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. We have two. So we're trying to, we're trying to get out from us. I think what a grant writer could manage. Out, out of that <laughs> corral. We, we, no we write a slow grant, yeah, believe me. Yeah. Um, potential police station, there's all kinds of that out there. It sounds to me like your idea of bringing this straight to the voters through a petition process has merit. And let the, you know, don't have the onus just be on the five of us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't really want to do guilt trip about that. I want to know what the people think. Um, and my question would be, who is best positioned to advise you on 
the wording of the warning and the way you word it on the petition uh, like we were working with Kelly on that. Is, is, yeah. is critical. Because mm -hmm. if, if you come yeah. to us with a... I can't say anything. If, it's not a if you come to us with a flawed petition... Mm -hmm. It's dead in the water. It's dead in the water. Right. Um, so the people need to know exactly what they're voting on. We need to know exactly what you're asking them to vote on so that we can put the warning out there in a properly worded fashion that everybody's on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, you know, whether it's Kelly or, I would, I mean, Kelly's a lawyer. She knows how this stuff works. She's not only our moderator, she's, a, she's an attorney. She should be in a good position to advise you on the, what the wording of that mm -hmm. should be. But the dollar figure needs to be current and exact. It can't, it can't be some amorphous. I think we should probably check with Emory on that too, because I believe that whatever the wording is on the petition is what goes on. That's exactly wording. right. And whether it makes sense or doesn't make sense, it's the exact wording that's on your petition. That yeah. I think it goes so, to the, the vote. I think a combination of Emory and and Kelly maybe, or some but some attorney who has expertise in crafting these things. So that's exactly right. The petition will say, "Shall the people of." Randolph right. bond approve a bond issue of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for the purpose yeah. of the renovation it, of. Do you actually say bond issue? Yes. Is that, that's what you're asking for. You ask yeah. if they will bond for that amount of money. And and the bond is for a specific period of time over. Usually they're for often a, twenty years. It'll say right? for how many years? Yeah. I mean, well, if they write it that yeah. way, it'll say shall they bond for X number of dollars for so many years. For the yeah. purpose of and right, right. Yeah. So when you say come back with a sp specific number, um, we can't, at least if I'm correct, solicit an R issue an RFQ for a municipal built building. It's got to come from the town. Is that correct? I mean that's what we went through before when when we first looked at the hall. And if that's the case. Um, What's the timeline on that? She, you know the answer possible? to that because we have the bread loaf estimate. It would have to be. You have updated. the estimate. You can just Could ask we, somebody to update that <laughs> and put it in today's numbers. That's one way to get it. We can pay somebody. To Are there can, industry yeah. standard escalators that can be applied to the bread loaf? The bread loaf. Well, just remember, board? you're asking for a bond from mm -hmm. the voters, and that's a set dollar amount. So yeah. that's. That dollar amount is what will be voted on. Yep. What you, what I'm afraid with your estimate here, and knowing what bids are coming in at for a whole variety of things from buildings to auto highway projects is, they are still jumping. Mm -hmm. And so if you end up saying to the voters, give you know we want X number of dollars, and we're going to give you this glorious haul, and then you come back and say, oh you know what, we need another five hundred thousand mm -hmm. to do that, it's not going to go over very well. So is a bond the best road to go? The, the quest, question to the select board, what's the best road for us to go? Should we talk about a bond or should we talk about raising taxes? Should, should it be a combination of raising taxes and having the intention for a grant, rate, a grant manager to be hired and pushing that side of the equation with us raising matching funds to, to augment whatever grant funding comes in? I mean, What's, what's what's the best way for us to approach this that would make the most sense for the town and, and, the, and the voters? Okay. And Trevor, do you want to weigh in at all on that question? Yeah, when you think about bonding capacity too, it, it's got a different process in statute, so you don't just warn a bond vote like you warn any other advisory vote when you're good at the deadline, you know, 30 days out, there are some public hearing and other notice requirements that go with the bond vote. So you have to work backwards from that. It was a different process. If we're talking about bonding for a building that the taxpayers are going to pay for before you make any decisions, let's go tour the police department. Um, let's go tour the village garage, the center garage, make sure that we've got, you get one shot at this for the next, I don't know, five, seven, ten years. Is this the one you want to take on? So there's that component too. too. If there's a $500,000 or $800,000 one-time tax increase, hey, I have not worked in a community or seen that go very well if you're asking for that much. So it's a lower percentage play, doesn't mean it doesn't work. 
one year, it raises the taxes theoretically to go away the year after. There's that. If you're looking at sort of responsible progress, and I hear the frustration in the room that it's been slow today, that third path might be the one that's the most responsible and balances all of the town's needs. And that's the trick for you, for me, is this all sounds good in a vacuum, but you've got to weigh it against every other thing that we've got. And that's not to try to create a cotton, it's just to say this is the whole Rubik's Cube. We're looking at one side tonight. And so any one of those, you can figure out the technical components too. It's just trying to pick which path is the one that's the right one, that's the most responsible, that fits both in the here and now, and looks out for the future. Um, we do know we're going to have a substantial amount of debt service capacity opening up fiscal 27 and beyond, putting together a budget for fiscal 25 now. So it sounds far out. It's the blink of an eye in a lot of cases. So but just to sort of give you all of that, there's no good answer, do this, do that, don't do that. But of those three rows, those are the pieces we got to get through first. One, one question, Trevor. Um, the restoration of a, a building like the hall certainly isn't done in one year. It's probably a you know, five to ten year process. Um, could, could um, with with the expense associated with that taking place over that time frame, um, why wouldn't we raise a tax rate to reflect that spread over that period of time? So year year one, you may want to bring in two hundred thousand dollars to get the foundation done, for instance, and get things up and running, and then for the following four or five years, you may um, want to. Uh, only raise an additional fifty to one hundred thousand dollars per year. You know what? What kind of model? What What does that model look look like? It would certainly raise the tax rate lower from year to year rather than a one year hit. I mean, yeah, you could structure it that way. The um, The variable there is that it's on a year to year basis mm -hmm. in, in each of these cases. So if the voters in any of those years say no, then that plan. It, it is altered from that point forward. The other thing is that it gets into this sort of the whole, we go back to that room, speak, that's a side of it. It's also, we're looking at however many cents for this. We're looking at however many cents to try to rebuild some of the staffing capacity on. So we can be better at managing grants, receiving grants, doing those things. Routing a planning and zoning administrator. We can desperately use some engineering services through an outside agreement. We're looking at capital reserve transfers. These are all general fund expenses, too, for the most part. Um, that uh, we know that we can't replace all nine fire trucks on anything resembling sort of the, the schedule that matches useful life. We can't even do the four or five that are most in need. So we're going to have to look at reserve transfers. There's still paving. There's still all of these things that, that play out on that tax rate. So it's about finding sort of the right timing, the right amounts, the right structure, and then sort of recognizing that each year there's a little bit of variability. And for some reason, the voters say yeah. no. You know, that, that alters that plan. It's another way to structure it, but we would need to know sort of what does that staircase look like. So where are we starting? What's the end goal? And then figure out the right uh, amounts. You know, do you, are they even payments across a number of years? Or do you start low, ramp up to a middle point, and then kind of taper off? And um, it's done, done both ways in, in capital planning projects, for example. When we think of maybe a major repair to one of our own buildings, we might stay for it in some measure, depending on time frame. Just one note, it is one of your own buildings. Mm -hmm. Our own buildings. I also just want to say, like, raising taxes, I mean, things are so hard right now, guys. I mean, you're kind of, yeah, like, it's so hard for families. Like, any tax increase is just, it's not just no one cares. It's things are really hard right now too. Yeah, it's central to the whole police discussion. On top of it too. too. Like, uh, you know, if you look at everything we're facing, your your regular stuff goes up, right? Insurance goes up every year. Labor rates go up every year. All those things in our budget. We have the police discussion going on right now. We've got um, both of our um, highway garages need some serious attention uh, you know there's there's this whole laundry list of things out there that we have to do and you know this needs to be prioritized for those there's also, no doubt this challenge sort of like, and, yeah and, you and, know for for you as a select board and for the town financially but 
Um, I don't think anybody can point to one period in time where those challenges don't exist. They exist every day. They're, they're always going to exist. Yeah, but, but they're but, like at a different level right now. Yeah. But yeah. Towns, don't, towns don't stop moving forward. Towns find a way to move forward. Well, my, I not, guess not, nothing remains static. I, guess. I, I know people who are actually moving out of Randolph because the tax rates are high. And they can move to another community where they are just living better because they can buy groceries because, you know, they have a little extra wiggle room. I mean, people are so paycheck to paycheck right now. I mean, I, I feel like that's one of the things that I want to be really mindful of, too. Is this, is, this all sounds great. This is wonderful. But when people are trying to decide where and how they can buy groceries, talking about just willy-nilly, let's just, why are we just raising taxes? Like, that's a big, that's a big thing for families right now. So I really think we should be mindful of that, too. We're, we're, we're sensitive to that. And, and we're we families, too. And, and we don't yeah. mention this, yeah. in, you know, in a trivial manner. This, this is something we can discussing for five to seven years. You know, it's, not, it's not a harebrained scheme that, that we just hatched up. We've been trying to look at this for years and trying to find a way forward. Um, as we said, this, this building is worthwhile. It's, 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 a, it's, an, it's got an honorable history in this town. And this town could use a community center. It really could. We, we don't, the town doesn't have a community center that everybody has full access to. Uh, you're, you're, you're not going to hold wed, wed, weddings and birthdays at Chandler. You're, you're not going to have a bar mitzvah in Chandler. You're, you're not going to have bingo in Chandler. You know, so the town needs something like this to help us build culture, to build community. It's what you know, helps bind us all together. It's important. It's important. And the town so needs to invest in community or, or else it's a race to the bottom. One make one short point. I haven't had a chance to talk about this yet. And every, everything you folks are saying makes sense, and I totally hear where you're coming from, and I don't disagree with or, with much of what you're saying at all. But when I look at this this estimate, I see eight hundred thousand dollars plus other projects, and it, so it looks like just right in front of us we have a million dollars, and and it's an old estimate. We know costs have gone up dramatically since since then, and given the other priorities that we've heard talk about this evening. It's, it's really hard to see how this is going to be our highest priority to, to raise a million and a half or two million dollars in, in any sort of near future. Um, so that's, that's my comment on that part. Um, but I also heard you say things like, well, what if we were able to raise money, a much smaller amount of money than, that we could then use as matches for grants? Mm -hmm. That sounds much more doable. Mm -hmm. and. So I think knowing much more about what kind of grant opportunities are out there, what are we really talking about? Are we talking about the town putting in $50,000 to get $500,000, $100,000 to get, you know, right. I think once we start having those kinds of numbers, then we can start really wrapping our minds around mm -hmm. the magnitude of it and where, you know, because the, the value of something in, in relation to our other priorities is really going to matter. It's not just a matter of yeah. how much money it is, it's how much money, what are we, what are we getting for our money, right? Where, what's, what's, what's our value? And so I think the, the, the idea of just bonding the whole thing, that, that doesn't sound like a good use of town's money in our current climate. Um, but if we're talking about spending um, a, a really a, a, a rather small fraction of that in order to leverage a much larger amount of money, I think that's something that we can talk about. That's my question. I think that's what, we, what we're interested in. I was going, when you said okay, before. I wasn't really hearing that very clearly. Yeah, yeah. I know. I'm glad you brought that yeah, up. Yeah. But you're, you're right. And any, any amount of money that the town ships in signifies the town's interest. And that will be right. helpful in, and, in writing grants. And, and, but but in, in my recollection is that typically when we get like when Kimball comes to us and says we need to do whatever, mm -hmm. fix the building for some, do some sort of renovation, they've identified the grant and the match, and then they come to the town and they say, can we apply for this? It's going to require a $50,000 match. Mm -hmm. And then we come back and we say, yes, or we say no, but at least but we have something very concrete, a very concrete fiscal proposal in front of us. Is that something that you can't do? Because it sounds like what you're saying is you can't do that. 
We need. We have to start with a foundation. What do you, What do you mean a foundation? The foundation. Hall needs Literally. a foundation. The hall needs a foundation. So you're, so you're saying that you bricks and mortar. No, no. We need. Yeah. Bricks and mortar. If we could just get started on it, like at least get the building picked up, a new foundation put under it, we can start really so, pulling more money in. So you're saying that the town would we can need, get more I, people I wanna, to. I want to be really clear. Yeah. So you're saying that. In order for you to raise any money from any of these granting agencies, that you will need the town to invest in a, f a full foundation for the building at the full expense of the town. So this $465,000 plus whatever the increase has been since then is what you would be the ask for the town before you can then go out and then require more matching money to do other renovations. Is that correct? You're, you're not entirely correct. I'm, no, right. that's why I want to know. Right, right. So, if we're going to approach grantors, uh, if we have the ability to say, you know, our group has raised fifty thousand dollars, the town has committed a hundred thousand dollars towards the restoration of this hall, beginning with the foundation, that enables us then to bring in the grants. It enable it, 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 it presents a much more enticing picture to potential grantors if we've got the backing of the town in that manner. Okay. So you don't need to complete the foundation of the building before going for other grants, is what you're saying? If we're trying to raise money to do the foundation, which, which is job one mm -hmm. for the building, then we can go after grants for the foundation. So, so there's potential. And so, if we have some, some idea that the town will, in fact, provide the match. So, so you're saying there is potential money out there to really? help pay for foundation work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. couldn't you apply for that grant, come to the town, come to the select board and say, we're gonna need this match for this grant to go get money to fix the foundation. Can we do that? We, we need to do it before we apply because you can't apply for the grant, get the grant, and then have to give it back because the town's not in a position well, that's what he's saying, to provide the match. Come to the town. So what happens right now with Chandler, with the library, with others mm -hmm. is they come to the town, and you saw it some tonight, mm -hmm. right? John Kaplan was here to talk about sidewalks. Right. And he came and met with us last time and said, hey, we have this group, we've done this survey, we have all this data, we'd like to apply for this planning grant to help us look at these sidewalks. Mm -hmm. So if you came and said, we have this grant opportunity, this is the work we'd like to do. This is how much we would be looking to apply for. Okay. The match is X. Our group has this portion of it. Will the town provide this portion? Okay. Okay. That's the okay. model that these others. And work then under. when we get it, it has to be spent in a certain period of time. Yeah. And that's the big. That that's another right. big. And the conditions of the grant are partly inform our decision. So if the grant comes with conditions that we feel like we can't meet, then we wouldn't approve applying for the grant. But if the grant, everything seems like, oh yeah, we can do that, then then we could apply. Then we would allow the, the grant application process to so go forward. So you're saying you can't do that because <coughs> you don't have the project manager yeah. and the day-to-day, -day, like clerk of the works type activities we on can the do project, that. correct? No, we can do no that. not necessarily. Well, it's... Betsy says you can. Uh -huh. Well, what, no, what, 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 what would the town no, do if you were going to build a new police station? Oh, dear Lord. We would be in some very <coughs> serious and, conversations. And, 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 and you want to start with a foundation. How, how would the town manage that? Well, on our capital projects, if we have a large, like when we did the fire station, we contracted with a clerk of the works okay. for that one. We had a town employee at the time that was the head of our buildings and grounds and a clerk of the works, and we had the chief of the fire department and myself that were all involved in overseeing that project. That was a very big project, though. So you're basically saying that any any of the activities that we're talking about, we'd also have to fund a clerk of the works to well, oversee Well, somebody's got to oversee yeah. it. Like, yeah. Yeah. how do you we, we deliver this project? Yeah, how we, do you know. put it, how do you scope it, how do you, what's your plans, how do you bid it, how do you... Yeah, but see, being a municipal state. building, that's, we don't know where one role ends and another begins, and, like, we can't do some things because it's a municipal building. You guys have to decide on the clerk of the works and all of that, right? 
I think that we're getting too into the yeah, details okay. tonight, and yeah, we've got a whole agenda yeah. to move, but I think what yeah. you do is you develop what the project is, you're going for the grant, you find the grant, and then you come in and that conversation takes place of how the, the grant actually gets delivered and the work gets done. Okay. Because every piece is going to be different. I can't give you a mm -hmm. checklist because right. okay. it no, won't I just go with everything. Doing mm -hmm. yeah. Roles, yeah. that's all. Yeah. Okay. I'm not doing right. role playing. And we have, yeah, we have discussed this and and um, and put it into budgets um, and understood, you know, when we've been scoping out what grants we would apply. I mean, Peggy is our grant writing genius, um, and she uh, oh, and Jesus. so we, we do have detailed conversations about. Of course, we're not just going to put in for a foundation. It's a big project. It has to have a it has to have correct project management. You know. Thank, Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for your time. It's a great conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. We'll bring something in December. Yeah. Can we get on the agenda again in December? <laughs> we'll skip in December meeting because we've been here so long tonight. We've already got our time in for the rest of the year. <laughs> uh -huh. I have to figure out. Hey, you'll have to do this in Reach out to Trevor with what you have and what you want to do, and he'll. If it's ready yeah. to go, it'll probably end up on the agenda. Oh, you did. <laughs> uh, discuss flood buyout programs and town participation in and in. This is um, another area where capacity has been the challenge, particularly um, project management capacity. We've been approved a few times in different Josie. ways about Josie. helping out with either uh, insurance buyouts or um, uh, you know, protection and repair activities. And there's two primary programs. One's through FEMA, and that's where the buyout is. That's what prompted the last one. And then the other one has been through the what they call the EWPP program. So it's the, what is it, the Natural Conservation Resource Service. So those are the ones like Lincoln Ave would be a buyout under that program sort of pre-existing both the storm and reflecting the damage to that property. Um, and then some of the repair work for folks who maybe have some slope stabilization issues on their private property. Um, that's not a resource the state has pointed folks to. The challenge with each of them is they require um, either a sponsor, is what they call it, which they mean the municipality in the EWPP example, or um, they require the town to take on all of the tasks. Tasks are similar. It's the appraisal, it's the um, site assessment, it's the hiring of the construction or the demolition contractor, the removal of the buildings, disposal of the buildings, it's remediation of the site, and then in the buyout program options, um, the town owns it. The repair ones are a little different in that we could be responsible for all of those pieces um, up to and including the match. There are ways to structure it so landowners are responsible for the match, but now we're in um, a game where we're either trying to this money from folks up front who by and large don't have it that's part of the appeal of the program um, or we don't have great tools to go and get it after so this is really just sort of a temperature taking conversation we assume a lot of these tasks it's a little bit like the um, NEP grant in that we might be able to create these sub grant agreements effectively or agreements with the individual property owners and we can probably hire a project manager I think for at least some of these it's an eligible cost we have to track that down the challenge we have with, say, the Arlington Drive property that prompted this conversation is that I don't know with the size of that slope, with the relation of the house to where the new edge of the bank is, thinking about where the rivers might potentially go. I don't know that that property owner has a lot of great options. Um, Vermont Emergency Management may use this as part of its pilot project where they take on all those tasks that might go to us. In that case, though, at the end of the day, we'd still end up as the owner of that property, so there's a separate liability consideration, at least with some of these. Um, and then they're looking at ways to see, even though they're different programs, maybe we can do Lincoln Ave in, in some way together with Arlington Drive. Those two properties are, are neighbors. They share a, a boundary and a, and a coastline. Um, coastline. And these <laughs> they, they come up a little bit in cycles, yeah. It's right um, around the corner from the But it's, uh, you know, it's difficult for us because those are time intensive projects in, in an area where we don't have any expertise. We're not, um, demolition is not what we do, um, or even you know, managing appraisal RFPs in some of these other communities. Doesn't mean we couldn't do it. 
Um, but we would definitely need someone who would hire and um, seek reimbursement for who can do these things if we jump in. Doesn't have to concern. So I just wanted to do a check and I said to the emergency management folks that they would take your temperature um, in terms of that. I think in particular we're thinking about Arlington Drive. We can even just be as narrow as that. Does mean we don't at the end of the day. To the extent we have liability, it's just if that bank continues to erode and starts to encroach on other properties, I mean, that's where you're sort of talking about any liabilities, um, such as they are. And the same thing if we go through with some of the grant funded purchase of 50 in the canal, um, we'd approve that. We have some initial action toward that, and then that one has sat in stasis due to resources. Um, no. We decided to start a police department. Oh, on the fly, and that took a little bit of time uh, and focus. And, uh, and so this is really, I, I feel really, I'm empathetic to these property owners because they don't know that they have a ton of good choices at the same time. It's either extend ourselves into a place where we're less familiar um, with hours we don't have, or see if we can find a different way maybe to get there. So that's where I'll check back around with, with the EM on the pilot project. That seems like an elegant solution, at least for Arlington. Um, in terms of if they can take those pieces on, that, that, that will help. But we basically will have to make a decision, I think, at the end about whether or not to accept the property. Um, and then if we do accept it, we can't do anything else with it. Um, like we could turn around and, and develop it, put anything on it. Uh, Jenna's going to just probably stay. Uh, natural space, which is what we had talked about with Lincoln Ave when that came up a while ago, too. Um, right. So it's really just to speak, do you, do you have any sort of level of interest in us trying to figure out how to participate in a way that keeps the sort of the town safe, that makes sure the projects move along, and that we fully understand any liabilities that, that would be associated with any of these? Yeah, that, I mean, the long-term liability is, is what I would be most concerned with. Um, do we have any sense um, of what that might really be? I mean, our, that's a, that Arlington property um, slope is, is basically a very tall cliff right now, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, oh yeah. And, yeah. and, and so is Lincoln Ave. Lincoln, but the Arlington one's even taller. Oh yeah. Right, yeah. by a good bit. And, and, I, and, and, and it's fearsome to walk out towards the edge because yeah. the ground is like soft. Like yeah. And, and it's really frightening. So, <clears throat> So if, if, if we're looking at that bank eroding further over time and threatening other properties, that would and we would have liability as a municipality, um, that would that would be my, my biggest concern in terms of taking this on. Trevor, can the, can we go through the whole process and that land just become like if there was an interested neighbor, can they own that land versus the town? They just can't build on it. Is that possible? Yeah, yeah we, we, we could see. I think, as I understand it, um, part of the reason we end up as the owner is so that we can make sure that nothing else happens to it. But if we wrote that into some sort deed of deed restriction, deed restriction, covenant kind of thing, I, I would. I mean, that seems to fit the spirit, but we'd have to know if that would be okay. Well, it does two things, right? It removes us from the liability in the future, and it leaves it on the grand list. Not that there's that much to lose on the grand list, right. but it's really the liability that's the big. Yeah. But if, if, if the liability is big enough for us to not want to take it on, why would a landowner want to? Right. Private landowner want to Some do that? Some of them will, but it could be an option, right? If they well, want to. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we could, we, we could certainly see. I, I'm just... Well, if I had the offer, if I was looking at a parcel next to me and it was either going to become, because we talked about changing the Arlington land into additional trails and park space and whatever, right? There was a whole recreation component to it that Perry was was talking about when that whole thing came up, you know, maybe I don't want that happening in my dooryard and I would rather own it and have it just turn into trees and vegetation versus yeah. screaming kids and disc golf course and you know, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Kids um, on well. my grass. <laughs> well, there are people like that. You know, I'm just like thinking, you know, yeah. you don't know. It, and, one of the other things, the state geologists, uh, we're trying to get them to come out and take a look, because that, it's sort of less 
Um, it's easier to see how the Lincoln Ave piece is less problematic because you've got that sort of spur that goes out and around. We've seen where the the damage is where the, our, our stormwater culvert comes out, and that's sort of the section that's FEMA eligible um, for some work. But if it's hitting the, the spur, you're not, and that property's already banned, and you sort of, there's a lower threshold for what's really in danger, who's really sort of endangered um, destruction of property. That's in. That Arlington one, though, because of the size of that slope, the composition of those materials, there's no way you're going to armor or stabilize that. And so that would be the, the thing that, a, say, the geologist could give us some insight on is, you know, what's this thing going to do based on what you can see, observe, um, you know, have experience in terms of, is this the kind of thing that's going to march forward over time just because of, of what it's composed of? Or is this sort of the, it needs that kind of July 10th type of wallop? Or, you know, what are we, what are we really talking about? And so hopefully we get that piece in there too so we better understand. And then and that would, I think, be useful even if we decided, say we were able to give it to a neighbor, a neighbor was interested or whatever, they had that knowledge. So at least say, this is what, you know, someone who's trained in this thinks. Yeah. It'll do, with, with the caveat being like, no, nobody really knows. I think so. we got to explore it. And, I feel like there's some, you know, it's back to that empathy side of it. Like, if that's the only way these folks are going to have some way out of where they're at, and we have to play some role in it, you know, I'd, I'd rather go in it with my eyes open on what it is. But if BEM is looking for a pilot, I mean, bring it on. And mm -hmm. yeah. Let them do all the legwork and whatnot and just bring us into the end. The, like, I mean, uh, Arlington is the, is the right choice because it's, it's bad. It really yeah. is. And, and sadly, the woman whose property was compromised on Lincoln Ave is now living up on Woodsy just around the corner from Arlington uh, with her, her uh, granddaughter, who is the branch manager at Northfield. Uh, so I know a lot of the players and I've had neighbors coming over, and every couple of weeks I walk over there with Lori Goldman or one of the one of the other people on Lincoln Ave, and <clears throat> you know I, I dread the thought of what's going to be there when another July 10th hits. And let's face it, it's going to happen. Um, and you know, it's always been a bad corner though, mm -hmm. that river, and that takes a it oh. just naturally. You know, oh yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, some of those. Yeah. Go. Well, so I kind of took out sixty feet. At the yeah, end of but most, most of that wasn't because of the river, though. It was just we had so much rain that the, the sandy soils got so wet that they just, it just slid. It wasn't actually yeah. the river yeah. eroding into the bank, even. Yeah. Was it a landslide? Yeah. Then? Was that, mm -hmm. that's like, it was a huge landslide? Well, it ha happened in chunks. It, ha uh, yeah. it happened in a bunch of different times. Like There's a pipe that, that extends out. This was the emails yeah. that we were getting the pictures of all the time. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. 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 So as long as we have rain events, even if the river doesn't move, yeah. we're going to continue to see these, these slopes DCGI did march back. After um, they did it statewide about all of the different slopes, that, and it, it is, it's rain, not just the rain. Mm -hmm. Will it help them if we go? That, that, that hillside is just sand. Yeah, there's Can nothing we capture it to use there. on there's our roads? <laughs> <laughs> what happens if we like take that bank down easy and just truck it to the two garages? It's <laughs> an awesome idea. <laughs> We're stabilizing through terracing and mining, yeah. <laughs> And maybe it's an option, right? Like, uh, if we had, if FEMA's going to pay us to do something for armoring it, what if we get it down to where it makes sense and the black and armor stacks it. of Odessa. Can we take material from the rivers anymore? But can we take it from the banks? <laughs> I mean, we got to get down there somehow to armor it, right? We might as well make ourselves a little zigzag road. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Aye, aye, aye. Does that give you what you need, Trevor? Uh, yeah, at a minimum, we'll start working it with the Arlington one, and hopefully, maybe that breaks a good model loose for some of the other ones that come up. And then um, we'll see if we can at least identify and have somebody or some group of somebody's ready that maybe can fill a kind of project manager role. I'm trying to remember way back to the EWPD and when T Work pitched it to us for Lincoln Ave. I 
I do think there is, our costs are certainly eligible, so if we can maybe under that umbrella, uh, that's how we get yeah. someone to manage the pieces. If we had to go separate program, separate route, um, we'll do that. But I think that'll work. So that rolls right into the whole FEMA flood update. Yep, we got our DI in on time. The deadline was the 6th. My oldest son just brought me some food, so I'm trying not to do I'll keep it off screen so nobody's too deaf. Uh, <laughs> well, there's no beard there to catch it and show it to us, so we got that right, story, story Tuesday night. Later, later, <laughs> <we're old. Yeah. laughs> um, so, so we got that in. Um, I, you know, we still have sort of one unknown cost. That's what we're going to do with the bridge that washed out on North Randolph Road. We talked, John had the idea for a box culvert, which I think um, put a lot of merit to it because of river alignment. Um, sturdiness we put it in and that's similar to what we did on view you know the natural bottom for aquatic passage and all that um, but we'll also look at a bridge so we don't quite know exactly what that piece will be we've got the temporary bridge everything's all set up to go and there'll be some armoring that goes on on the other side of that and then we do know for slope stabilization rough order of magnitude we did get uh, a quote we reset to three i think john said and only one responded on the Lincoln avenue piece so we have an estimate of what um, right, sort of right at the end of that corner where our storm drain shoots out, that's what FEMA will sort of cover on either side. So we can at least add some armoring, repair that storm drain and that outlet, and that will at least help stabilize some of that there um, for that piece. So those are the three open projects. The rest of the stuff on the list is all complete. We may have a few odds and ends, like repairing some boards on covered bridges and those types of things. But, um, Everything else on that damage inventory is, is more or less there. We're uploading photos. FEMA's got a sheet, and we did a good job taking photos. The problem is now it takes a long time to, to get them all into that sheet and load them up, so we're chopping away at that. But, um, so we're in pretty good shape. We know we'll have 12.5% of the total. We don't quite know what the total cost will be. Um, I think I mentioned in the report where we spent today, we have a few out invoices outstanding. I don't anticipate that'll go too much higher than say you know, half a million at the most conservative and another half or so for the slope stabilization, 250 or so for Lincoln Ave and then whatever that um, North Randall Road Bridge project ends up being. Um, so we may end up in that $2 million range at the end of the day, which would be good. It puts us around what, 250, something like that as our, as our cost. We, we're thinking at one point it could be three, three and a half, but um, Thankfully, we're pretty good shape. So there's, we just want to just keep you aware as we go through these, as we pass each threshold. The damage inventory, we have a 60-day window from we had an initial meeting to Monday. Um, that's sort of, you can edit your list and you can add to your list, but to do those things is much more difficult than to try to get your list right the first time uh, of projects and then to get it in. And so we met last Thursday made sure we did a final review with our rep from FEMA um, made sure that we had um, Palmer, there's a piece of Palmer Road that had to be repaired that hadn't made it into a prior version, so we got that in with some of the costs and the invoice and those, so I, I think we're in pretty good shape. Um, hopefully, we'll start to see money sooner than later, though we have a few steps to go before that, but we're getting closer. Nice. Any questions on North Wells and Reservoir Project update? Uh, again, just another one I wanted to check in with you. We um, have sent a bunch of materials. Trina mentioned early in the meeting, we got a $775,000 federal earmark um, through Senator Sanders uh, and his staff. Um, that filled the funding gap that we had after we opened construction bids. It's going to be an EPA state and tribal assistance grant. Um, so we're hopeful that we can start to move through kind of the grant agreement setup, paperwork training, all of those things. The whole idea, and then the bond bank just approved our SRF loan. So the course we're on right now is just kind of nice. We did the interim financing carry us through earlier in the summer. Um, once the SRF loan is in place, we'll draw on reimbursement from that first. Once we've sort of drawn that amount, so it's a million and a half dollar loan and another six, seven hundred thousand dollars of subsidy, so we can draw that much back. The subsidies don't go on the final loan amount, um, and then. The Northern Borders grant would probably be the next piece in the stack. 
and then the EPA stag grant would come at the end. And what's nice about that is that if it, if it comes at the end, the last major piece is the tank itself. That's the thing that's coming next summer. So those two things should marry up well in terms of we use that money for tank and tank install, and there's a pretty straight line um, between the two pieces. And then we can have a conversation, I think I mentioned it maybe at the next time. We'll be able to link up, so here's where we're at this, at this percent of the way through the project. Timeline-wise, we're not quite 50%, but we have a winter shutdown built in, um, but we're getting close to that. A lot of tasks are being completed, everything that can be queued up before the winter shutdown will be, um, so that it really is coming back, putting in the tank, making some connections, a little bit of instrumentation, and installing a generator, and then demolishing and restoring the, the site with the old tank. Um, so we're, we're in pretty good. There's some talk about a 50-day extension for the contractor that's tied to delivery of the tank, um, but it's more contract window with some engineering costs and any kind of significant going live impact. So, you know, we're thinking, we've, we've always said July to try to be conservative. Um, so we're still thinking somewhere in that time frame that that well is fully online and operational. But, knock on the lid, so far so good. And so when we, when we get to that point where it's live and whatnot, at what point do we need to be looking at rates? we're going to have that additional loan to pay back. Yeah, I, I think we're going to start to look at rates through the budgeting process and we'll want to engage the Water Wastewater Advisory Committee at around the same time and then through there so that maybe for July 1 we'll know what the rate structure should look like um, for that because we know that the to repay that loan based on the figure we got from the bond bank you're talking a little less than $27,000 for that so we have sort of that known amount that rolls in and fiscal 25 will be the first year that we repay um, and make a repayment on that I think 30 to 30 year time if I'm remembering right the, the drinking water ones usually are uh, so and then we we may even want to seek um, we talked to RCAP solutions a while ago Chris and I did about uh, a rate study so that we could do the increase or do the um, you know an analysis and make any changes we need to now that process is, has been slow and may have even stalled out. So we were talking about different ways that we may seek to get some assistance to get that done. Um, <coughs> so we may have a proposal for you there in the next month or two that, that would help accelerate that in terms of at least doing all the sort of the, the legwork, building out some of the modeling um, and moving us along there. But it's been a while. I forget exactly how long it's been since we've, there was a rate adjustment a little while ago we still think we're talking, what, five, seven years-ish, if I remember the story right, but yeah. it's been a bit. It's been, right. yeah, it's been quite yeah. a while. Five or seven years mm -hmm. sounds about right. And so the rate study is only on the water? It, no, we, should, if we did it, we do one on both ends, yeah. Yeah. Because that one, we had talked about the minimum, right, there was a conversation about a minimum, uh, and no, and right now we, Base it on everything, right? It's on flow or whatever. And about going to a minimum, yeah. so we didn't have to get meters and some of that. Remember, there was a conversation about. I don't remember how it all went, but it was a. There was a town that had a resident paid X, and a businesses were metered or something. And we talked about the savings if we didn't have to have meters and we didn't have to have all that. Remember that conversation. I don't, I mean, maybe we touched upon it briefly. I don't yeah. remember a, a very like detailed kind of conversation about about whether about our rates could be made so that we're easier and we didn't have all the meters and all that right. meter reading. I think it came when we were talking about bringing in Randolph Center. So, some, but I don't know. It was a, seen as a, it would be a cost savings to them because you wouldn't have to have meters. We wouldn't have to have anybody. Right. You probably have to make the minimum go up. A lot though to make that work. Maybe a lot of a lot of the lower users would see giant increases in their bills. Okay. All right. Um, any questions on that topic? Manager's report. 
Not too much to add from what you see, other than um, at the end of more than 90 tons of hot mix shoveled and raked by hand, they were all pretty tired. Um, so I think they've been, they got some pretty good sleep and then they were out, out there early, um, ready for the storm. We were able to put some of the new folks out into duty and at least get them acquainted with. We've got three employees in CDL school basically right now of the new ones that joined. The uh, fourth one we hired when he gets here just after Thanksgiving we already has a CDL, so we're, we're good to go there. So that forced us to shift some resources around a little bit for response to the storm. But tactically, we went out. They only did, I think John said, three truckloads of salt total for all the paved roads. They went out and sanded in a few spots on the gravel roads. We generally left the snow because it's such a little amount. The roads are not anywhere near frozen sort of a, a better thing to leave it rather than to try to tear it up or, or, or knock it off. So if anybody asks you why we weren't out there doing anything, we were, it was a tactical choice that we did last year and it worked well for us in this kind of weather context. But so they, they were out there getting after it and then we were gonna do a winter maintenance meeting, the grand irony today, we were gonna do that. And then I was home due to a school closure and they were out Spread salt sand anyway, but we'll do that and check in. That's where we coordinate between water, wastewater, highway, buildings, and grounds. Um, check in with the rec to see if there's anything we need to. Just so everybody knows what everybody's doing and where extra resources might be and how to help. And worked well last year, so we'll do that. But we're at that time already. The plow trucks rumble. <laughs> and they were. <laughs> yeah. Did you get the phones fixed? Monday they should be up with full voicemail. There was, what was it, it was a card of some kind and then it has to be programmed. So there was a, it's a parts issue where I think, but we found a good repair person, um, which was no small feat given the age of the system. At some point we'll have to think about it, but this fix should should do us for a while, right Kim? Um, yeah, I think so. Pretty Otherwise, I'd be called yeah. as to you, Kim. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, I know, yeah. Well, I mean, he, he could have come in and said, you know, you guys need a new system, but he didn't. He just said, you need a new email card, I mean, voicemail card, and he got one installed that was missing a um, password. So I'll have the new password hopefully by Monday, and everything Good. should be set. Yeah. So. But anecdotally, though, it's been kind of nice in that most of the phone calls we get or for the clerk's office and the way the modified system rings is it sort of rings directly to them now. So that, that part has been okay for us in terms of yeah. it's fewer call transfers. And yesterday he actually took- I don't, know, I don't know if Mary and Mary love it, but it's been working out pretty good. Yeah, and he took my phone away yesterday to set the whole thing up. So my phone was gone for half the day. And I was like, I, ah, I can't answer it. It's not even here. Oh. <laughs> it's still working out, it's fine. Any other items or any questions for Trevor? Before we entertain a motion to find that we need to go into executive session. Thomas, this feels like a motion for you. Tom's already. Okay. Well, yeah, except I you can just say your. I, you moving. think I have this memorized? Just yeah. move. I don't want. Uh, I move that we consider a motion to find an executive session is necessary and prudent. And the premature general knowledge would place the town at a disadvantage. A second. Oh, those are the big ones. I'll do the second one. You can do the second one too. Tom, Gary, both of you do it. That way it'll be easy. <laughs> Uh, I move that we consider a motion to enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA 313A 1E pending or probable litigation and 1 VSA 313A 3 appointment evaluation of a public official. I always wonder what that little squiggly S0 section. thing is. Oh, is that section? <laughs> I'll second that one as well. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.